of the seventh session of the Comedy on Environment and Development will commence shortly. May I please ask all to take your seats. Thank you. She's not used to the Thailand So maybe we can maybe MC can just yeah, say yeah, yeah, while yeah. we wait for the yeah we yeah. just uh, start uh, while Vina is not here yeah Vina. Huh? Oh, okay. 
he cannot reach her. No, she. I think she's parking her car. No, she can. He cannot reach her. He uh-huh. like, tried calling her and she cannot. Yeah. He cannot reach her. He was in touch so with could her. somebody uh, stay he outside and uh, try to reach her? But mm-hmm. meanwhile, we can just uh, start. Yeah. Yeah, let us start. Let us start. Okay. 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 Keep the opening remarks for yeah. the webinar will mm-hmm. be in. Mm-hmm. Keep the opening remarks for now. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a part in the scenario where we say we invite the floor to Kalira Ryan for opening remarks. You'll have to speak up for her. Yeah, the one before Rina will mm. skip her. Um, yeah. Please, just so just. If she, I think by the time the slides are done, she might. Yeah. Be if she comes, yes, we invite her. If not, Otherwise, we just yeah. skip it. Okay. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, good morning and welcome to the seventh session of the comedy on environment and development. The session is held both in person and virtually via Zoom. Kindly note that remote simultaneous interpretation of the proceedings is provided by the United Nations for the purpose of facilitating communication. There are six official languages of the UN, four of which are used at ESCAP. Participants are requested to be mindful of the additional difficulties experienced by interpreters when working in remote mode and of the increased likelihood of disruptions to the audio feed to and from the interpreters. Only the speech of the inter- or intervention in the original language is verbatim and constitutes an authentic record of the proceedings. In any case of inconsistency between the interpretation and the speech or intervention in the original language, the latter shall prevail. In addition, interpreters servicing remote meetings cannot be held liable for interruption of service, pixelation, freezing or loss of visual input, partial or complete loss of audio, audible artifacts, unauthorized access to personal or confidential data, leaking of information due to inadequate soundproofing, and or data loss. Thank you for your attention to these matters. I now invite Mr. Sangmin Nam, Director of Environment and Development at ESCAP, and the Secretary of the Comedy to conduct the opening ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, good morning. Uh, in this opening, now I invite Mr. Kabe Saidi, Deputy Executive Secretary of ESCA, to open the seventh session of the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Sagmin. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, dear participants, dear colleagues, uh, I'm really very pleased to welcome you to the seventh Committee on Environment and Development that starts today with uh, our senior official segment and is then followed on the 1st of December by the ministerial segment. I think many of us uh, gathered today, uh, I hope maybe, Uh, are sensing more than ever that that there is now a building urgency uh, to to address the the planetary crises uh, that that we have been talking about for many years. And by doing so, to protect our health, our well-being, and indeed our very survival. The UN Secretary General at the opening of the UN Climate Conference, or COP27, delivered I think a very stark message to the world to either choose to cooperate or perish. And his words were, in a way, a very blunt reminder of the crisis that we face. But they were also a reminder of the cooperative pathways out of this very crisis. The critical role that regional cooperation plays has, of course, been a central driving force for ESCAP's member states and for the intergovernmental bodies, and is very much reflected in the theme of our committee session today, the theme of protecting our planet through regional cooperation and solidarity. As we meet for this seventh session of the committee, we, I think, do so with a very keen awareness that we are still far away from achieving a healthy environment in our region of Asia Pacific. ESCAP's analysis shows that in the last two years, the region has further regressed against the environment-related 
SDGs, including on climate action, on oceans, on biodiversity, cities, consumption and production, issues that you will be deliberating during this session. With respect to the climate, both science and experience have made it clear that our planet is fast approaching tipping points, and nowhere do we see that more clearly than here in Asia and the Pacific. Countries like Pakistan find themselves on the front lines of the climate crisis. The losses and destruction from climate change are already undermining decades of development gains in our region. While our average per capita emissions remain below the global average, our region is now responsible for more than half of global greenhouse gas emissions. Yet the ambition level of nationally determined contributions across the region falls short of putting us on the 1.5 degree pathway. The continued reliance on fossil fuels are not only leading to irreversible climate change, but impacting health and livelihoods across many countries in our region. At the same time, there are some positive signs, and we have to acknowledge that, that are emerging from our region. Some 40 countries have already made climate neutrality pledges, but of course we need more commitments and more ambitious actions, including to accelerate the energy transition and to make the lofty pledges real. Closely linked to climate change is the clean air crisis we see across our region. 90% of our population breathes unsafe air and our cities are regularly reported as the worst polluted in the world. Clean air measures for transport, agriculture, industry and energy are available, but we have not seen implementation keeping up with the pace of the pollution. Much of the global mass extinction of biodiversity is also taking place in Asia and the Pacific. Biodiversity is still regressing as numbers of threatened species of plants and vertebrates are declining with as much, uh, with as, much as a quarter of the endemic species at high risk of extinction. And the temperature of the seas is warming and ocean acidification and pollution are endangering the delicate balance of marine ecosystems. Our development patterns, including through unplanned and unmanaged urbanization, have led to increasing air, water, and soil pollution. Many of our environmental challenges intersect in our cities, and a commitment to creating sustainable and resilient cities is an important step towards, address uh, towards addressing our, envir uh, our environmental crisis as a whole. The common thread of all of these environmental threats and challenges that they pose is that they are transboundary, crossing national borders. This means that solutions must be based on multilateralism, but a multilateralism that is networked and that is inclusive. At the global level, this year, the UN Environment Assembly, the UN Ocean Conference, COP27 that has just finished, and the forthcoming CBD COP are all paving the way for meaningful engagement and, we hope, reinvigorated multilateralism on environmental issues. Now it is up to countries to provide our Asia-Pacific region with a clear roadmap for implementation. In this context, I really would like to thank all delegations for the extraordinary collaborative consultative process of this committee and the time many of you have spent and invested in guiding an agreement on the declaration that is being presented to the ministerial segment later this week. This draft ministerial declaration with its regional action program on air pollution is in many ways the perfect basis to foster stronger regional cooperation on climate action, on ecosystems, on oceans, sustainable urban development, and environmental rights. And the regional action program on air pollution provides a really strong foundation for regional collaborative action on this common crisis. So distinguished delegates, representatives, and excellencies, in concluding, we very much look forward to your deliberations. We look forward to learning from your experiences 
and to the outcomes of this committee, setting clear directions towards a healthier environment in Asia and the Pacific. I wish us fruitful deliberations and very concrete results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chaedi. I now welcome Ms. Winarin Runetanonda, co-founder of Thailand Clean Air Network, who is leading the work on connecting air quality management, public participation, and environmental rights for her to deliver opening remarks. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to be invited to give my opening remarks. My name is Wienerin Luli Tanon. I co-founded a citizen clean air advocacy group called the Thailand Clean Air Network. We are a group of active citizens from a multitude of professional backgrounds who simply could not stand idly by as the very air that we are breathing in deteriorates. As such, we joined forces and brought our collective talents together to volunteer to push for policy-led solution to this environmental crisis. One of our crowning achievements is the drafting of the very first citizen-led clean air legislation for Thailand. This draft legislation addresses the underlying structural problem that has impeded air pollution from being sustainably managed in this country. It, was, it had received resounding support from both the Thai general public as well as the UN repertoire on human rights and the environment. This draft legislation has been submitted to the Thai parliament for almost a year now. We hope that it would finally be deliberated for consideration as passage into a law, which would be a testament that protecting the very air we breathe does indeed transcend above Thai politics and business interests. The Lancet Commission described pollution as the largest environmental risk factor for disease and premature death globally. Air pollution accounts for over 7 million annual deaths worldwide, of which 4 million occurs in the Asia and Pacific region. Within the ASEAN region, Thailand ranks amongst the top in terms of its poor air quality. Based on the state of global air report, over 32,000 Thais have died prematurely in 2019 due to air pollution. Thailand adopts national air quality standards that are weaker than the WHO recommended guidelines. This policy alone results in average mature deaths of around two years in Thailand. However, for those residing in the northern part of Thailand, where the air quality is the worst, average life expectancy may be reduced by as much as three years. And this is based on the latest research by the University of Chicago. Addressing the intersecting threats of air pollution and climate crisis by cleaning the air that we are breathing actually creates many multipliable, multiplier effects. This is because many causes of air pollution are causing climate change. For example, short-term air pollutants are responsible for half of global warming. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this huge opportunity seems to be a mist as only 2% of global climate finance today explicitly tackles air pollution. Furthermore, air pollution also knows no national boundaries. And it's also linked to a much bigger global supply chain issue where polluting production bases have shifted from the global north to the global south. Therefore, this calls for the adoption of not only a regional and international approach to this problem, but also one that places environmental equity as a core tenant. In closing, I would like to share anecdotal evidence from medical doctors who reside in northern Thailand who have seen a number of young patients, many as young as 14 years old, with abnormal growth on their lungs. This, unfortunately, is an early telltale sign of lung cancer, and the time period that coincides with the age of these young patients coincides with when the air pollution in northern Thailand has been the most toxic. I do not think there could be a more pressing call for action when the lives of children, who are the very future of a country, is being cut short like this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Vinarin, for your inspirational remarks. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished delegate, we will now take on agenda item 1B, the election of office for the senior officials segment. In accordance with the rules of procedure of ESCA, the Bureau shall comprise a chair and two vice chairs. I now open the floor for nominations for the position of a chair and vice chairs for the senior officials segment. I recognize the distinguished delegate yes. from the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Excellency Mr. Chair and uh, honorable delegates. My delegation has the honor to propose the following delegates to serve on the bureau for the senior official segments of the Seventh Committee on the Environment and Development. As Chair, His Excellency Mr. Amenatov V. Yawali, Ambassador and Permanent Representative to ESCAP, Embassy of the Republic of Fiji, as Chair. And as Vice Chairs, Mr. Hoda Ali Sharif, Deputy Ambassador and Permanent Representative of ESCAP, Embassy of the Republic of Maldives, and Mr. Dawadash Sambo, Councillor and Deputy Permanent Representative of ESCAP, Embassy of Mongolia. My delegation is confident that the distinguished delegates who have been nominated would discharge their duties efficiently and effectively for the successful deliberation of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished delegate from the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran, uh, for the nomination as a chair, His Excellency Mr. Amen Natab Yaoboli, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Fiji to ESCA, and as a vice chair, Ms. Huda Ali Sharif, Permanent Representative of the Republic of Maldives to ESCA, and Mr. Davadash Shambu. Deputy Permanent Representative of Mongolia to ESCA. Would any delegation wish to second the nomination made or propose alternate nominations? I recognize a distinguished delegate from Indonesia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My delegation has the honor in seconding the nomination which have uh, just been proposed by the distinguished delegate of the Islamic Republic of Iran for the bureau position for the senior official segment of the Seventh Committee on Environment and Development. My delegation has a full confidence in the proposed bureau in uh, discharging the, their duties for a successful deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished delegate of Indonesia. Are there any other nominations uh, for the Bureau of Senior Officials segment of the Committee on Environmental Development at its seventh session? I see none, uh, I hear none, and I thus have the pleasure to formally announce the Bureau of Senior Officials segment of the seventh session of the Committee on Environmental Development as follows. As a chair, his Excellency, Mr. Amen Atabo Yaoboli, uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Fiji to ESCA, and as a Vice Chair, uh, Ms. Huda Ali Sharif, Permanent Representative of the Republic of Maldives to ESCA, and Mr. Davadashi Shambu, Deputy Permanent Representative of Mongolia to ESCA. Please join me in congratulating uh, the Office of the Bureau on their election. It is now my honor to invite Ambassador Amen Tanaba to conduct the meeting from this point forward. Yeah. You can.
Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to serve as the chair of the senior officials segment of this important meeting. And I thank you all for the confidence placed in me and the great honor that you have bestowed on my country and me. Together with the honorable vice chairs and with the support of the ASCAP secretariat, I shall endeavor to discharge the responsibilities of serving you as your chair to the very best of my abilities. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, we have an exciting agenda ahead of us. As the chair of the senior official segment, I shall do my utmost to ensure that this meeting achieves its objectives and results in meaningful outcomes for our future work on environment and development. I would, not, I would now like to hand over to the secretary of the committee of our seventh session for some housekeeping announcement. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, may I now uh, provide uh, some quick reminder for delegate participants joining us via the e-conferencing platform, Zoom. To select the preferred UN language, the interpretation icon with a drop-down menu is available on the lower right of your screen. When you want to make uh, the in an intervention, kindly click the raise hand button. Your virtual hand will appear. When the chair calls upon you to take the floor, please click unmute and smart start the video and deliver your intervention. Once you have uh, completed your intervention, kindly click mute microphone and stop video. For technical issues related to Zoom, kindly click chat icon and type your message there. Our technician will assist you shortly. The Secretariat will be monitoring the messaging in Zoom. However, the Secretariat kindly requests that all substantive questions and interventions are to be raised through your delegation by using the raise hand button only. And finally, to prevent echoes and interference, please ensure that the language you selected to listen to is the same as the language you speak while taking the floor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Secretariat. Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, delegates, let us now take up agenda item 1C, adoption of the agenda, and consider the provisional agenda as contained in document SCAP slash CED slash 2022 L.1. Are there any comments on this document? I'm seeing none. If there are no comments, the agenda in document SCAP slash CED slash 2022 L.1 is adopted. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, let us now proceed with the consideration of agenda item two, review of the implementation of the ministerial declaration on environment and development for Asia and the Pacific 2017. The document pertinent to this agenda item is ASCAP slash CED slash 2022 one. Under this agenda item, the committee is invited to comment on the assessment of progress made since 2017 with respect to country actions, regional cooperation, and support provided by the Secretariat, share initiatives to advance progress on environment and development challenges, consider the observations regarding regional co cooperation and effective multilateralism, and provide recommendations for actions. The discussions in this session will, will be informed by a presentation of the Secretary's assessment of progress as contained in the document, 
we will then hear additional perspectives from three discuss discussions. After that, we will open the floor for statements from delegations from governments and from other stakeholders, if time allows. May I now invite Ms. Katinka Weinberger, Chief of Environment and Development Pol of the Policy Section of ASCAP, to introduce this agenda item. Ms. Weinberger, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, distinguished delegates. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to brief you on document CED 2022-1. The background to this document is that in 2017, the Asia-Pacific countries had agreed to the Ministerial Declaration on Environment and Development for Asia and the Pacific 2017, and that Ministerial Declaration establishes the agreement to act together on common themes, the decision to work together on environment and development priorities in the region, and the request to support governments in the implementation to the Secretariat. And the document reviews the implementation of the Ministerial Declaration on Environment and Development for Asia and the Pacific 2017 by answering the following questions. What progress has there been since 2017? What are the trends in cooperation that we see? And what are some of the considerations for future action? So actually, we have seen really important achievements at global level um, in addressing environment and development challenges. Um, everybody will remember the recent COP27 agreements, which reached agreement on uh, climate and loss climate loss and damage agreement, um, the new urban agenda, which decouples urbanization from environmental pollution and strengthens city climate action. And progress right now is uh, a first meeting to find agreement towards a global plastic pollution treaty, but also really important progress that has been made in countries in the region. For example, by tracking progress through the establishment of national indexes, by ensuring enabling environments for investment, for example, through the development of sustainable finance roadmaps, through better policy coherence and better coordination, um, for example, by coordinating commission and state boards for water resources management. So all in all, many bold initiatives that we see, whether they're related to mega marine protected areas, landscape restoration, forest planning, city climate action plans, or urban plastic waste reduction. Also very important progress that has been made in addressing uh, the climate challenge that we're facing. Um, around 40 ESCAP member states have made carbon neutrality and net zero pledges and have started developing enabling frameworks and strategies for the implementation of their commitments. But progress is threatened by the environmental pressures and um, they are growing in the context of economic slowdown and also ambition is still not high enough to reach climate targets. So a couple of words on how the Secretariat has responded to these um, needs. The UN Office of Internal Oversight Services had completed an evaluation of the Environment and Development subprogram in July 2021. And that evaluation concluded that EDD areas of work were considered highly relevant to the needs and priorities of member states in the region by most of our stakeholders. This diagram shows broad areas of work streams in the Environment and Development subprogram which are related to analysis, guidelines, and tools. They include, for instance, voluntary local reviews or our work on climate ambition assessments. They include regional public goods, including our learning platforms, regional cooperation, which includes the platforms that have been established for regional exchange, such as our regional ocean decay program and the Asia Pacific Day for the Ocean. The technical cooperation, which we provide as a direct assistance to member states, including on plastic waste, city climate action, and climate smart mechanization, and also the sole initiative network on weed growth, which was established as an outcome of the 2005 Ministerial Conference on Environment and Development, 
and since its inception has engaged more than 17,000 officials in 38 countries of the region. Our sub-program work focuses mainly on the environmental SDGs, although it, its work touches, our work touches on every SDG. And in 2021, activities were balanced between technical cooperation and intergovernmental work with a smaller investment in terms of time resources going into analytical work. And perhaps let me also point out that almost two thirds of our activities are at regional level, which means they involve more than three countries, while approximately 30% of our work are implemented at country level. Now, um, ahead of the seventh session of the committee, um, the Secretariat had administered a survey to gather expert stakeholder views, and we really wish to thank all of you who had participated and provided responses. We had received a total of 102 responses from 31 member states. Approximately more than one-third of those were um, from national and local governments, and around one-third from civil society and other NGOs. And the insights from these surveys um, uh, really give us guidance on some very important questions. For example, how concerning are the challenges? And there is um, a clear um, message that is being brought across in this survey that accelerated action is needed, especially on climate action, environmentally sustainable growth, environmental quality and securing ecosystem services, people, human security and environment, as well as sustainable urban development, but that climate action is the most concerning challenge. In terms of the barriers to progress so far, um, we see um, responses related to lack of capacity, knowledge and skills, as well as governance across all respondent groups. Um, but in terms of uh, respondents from official government, um, respondents, the main issue are lack of resources. The views on how much progress has been made on regional cooperation are relatively split, but a clear message in terms of reinvigorating multilateralism for ma making more progress going forward, in terms of more than 80% of responses considering this as critical or somewhat important. The survey had also explored respondent views on the areas that are most important for reinvigorating multilateralism. And of the five areas um, identified, I would like to point out that the one that received the most responses was that we need to do better um, in terms of information sharing, transparency, and evidence of action. And this was followed by accountability measures and economic system and financing interventions. But I would also like to emphasize that the need for stronger solidarity was strongly emphasized by all survey respondents. Now, there was additional feedback that we received um, during preparations for this committee. And this includes that um, multilateral systems must step up to the challenges of managing emerging crisis on the multiple fronts that we see, and they must invest in becoming fit for purpose. There is the need to boost solidarity and to scale up technical support, in particular for countries with special needs. The need to strengthen cooperation, both at sub-regional and city levels, for more inclusive, more networked multilateralism. The need to um, engage civil society and the public to enhance impact. And further opportunities in promoting science and evidence-based action. And with this uh, very brief overview, I do come to my last slide. As reflected in the document um, 2022-1, the committee may wish to take note of the assessment of progress made since 2017 and the support provided. It may wish to take note of the initiatives of member states and also share additional perspectives and initiatives at no national and at local levels. It may take note of the proposals that are contained in the present document with respect to strengthening multilateral action in five key policy areas and recommend to governments, other stakeholders, as well as the Secretariat to strengthen multilateralism to support the outcomes of the Seventh Committee. Thank you very much, Chair.
I thank uh, Ms. Katinka Weinberger for her comprehensive uh, presentation. We shall now proceed to hear from three discussions. And the first is uh, Ms. Yatsuka Kataoka, Program Director of the City Task Force of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. Ms. Kataoka, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, it's my honor to be here to share my views on the progress of the environment and the development in the region. With the COVID-19 impact, more people have become more aware of the vulnerability of our socioeconomic systems. Extreme heat, uh, heavy rains, and then uh, heavy rains, and also the uh, flooding uh, impacts uh, the uh, observed in the regions. And then the, that is considered as a climate change impact affected people's lives, natural resources, and infrastructures. Impacts of the uh, impact of the uh, pandemic and uh, pan, uh, pan, uh, and infrastructures. Impact of the pandemic and the climate change increased the people's awareness on the environment and more sustainable way of the development. In the survey conducted by Secretariat, climate change actions was identified the area of greatest concerns in the key environment and development areas. And I welcome the results. Why? Because climate actions to achieve the global climate goals set forth the Paris Agreement uh, needs, the, uh, the, uh, needs the transformative changes of our society, which are interlinked with other environment and development concerns expressed in the survey, namely environmental sustainable economic growth, environmental quality and ecosystem services, and human security and sustainable urban development. Having said that, today I would like to highlight two points. First, it's the importance of integrated actions towards sustainable development supported by the evidence-based approach. In June this year, the third global conference on strengthening, strengthening synergies between the Paris Agreement on the climate change and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable de Development was convened by the United Nations Development, Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, and the Secretary of the UN Triple C uh, Secretariat and hosted by the Japanese Ministry of the Environment in partnership with the United Nations Universities and Digest. The conference highlighted the need of the increase of the climate synergies and co-benefits for closing the ambition gap. As a future action, the conference also highlighted the need of promise, prom promoting integrated planning by utilizing existing infra instruments, such as NDCs, Brantley National Review, VNRs, and National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans. Integrated planning in consideration of climate change, biodiversity, and ecosystem services and SDGs is very important for Asia and the Pacific. The region is the center of global, gro global economic growth, and vast natural resources has been supporting the growth. As being already aware, increase of population growth and economic development without due consideration of sustainability deployed natural resources in the region, and climate change added pressure to the natural resources. Inclusiveness also important, and SDGs can provide as a guidance for the inclusive development. Evidence-based approach is a key in promoting integrated planning. Evidence-based approach supported by best available knowledge and data can also increase trust of different stakeholders at local, national, and regional level. And it can provide firm basis of multilateral cooperation and coordinated actions. Exploring way to gather and manage better data and informa information, including a way to share them with different stakeholders should be the one uh, actions to be strengthened. The second point is the local actions, especially cities and multi-level actions. Cities and urban areas have been recognized as a source of climate forces. Urbanization without adequate planning, cons uh, planning consideration will further intensify multiple climate risks. It also intensifies the risk to human systems, such as poverty, inequality, risk to human health and natural systems, including ecosystem services and biodiversity. On the other hand, Cities and urban areas are the place where innovative climate and urban sustainable solutions can be invented and demonstrated. Such innovation, innovative climate and sustainability solutions can be also, also attract investment, create a new job, 
and with this inequality. What I would like to stress here is that local climate and sustainability actions not only for the local, but for the national and the regional. They can be a driver of the swift transition at national, level, national and regional level. Energy and the Pacific has been a center of rapid activation. Increase of the numbers of secondary cities are also a feature of urban development in the region. Therefore, it is important to take consolidated actions to improve urban policies, not only local level, but also national level, sub-regional, and the national level. Cities has already taken actions corresponding to the in increase of national government's pledge of the carbon neutrality and in the region. More cities in the region joined the journey of the Paris Citadel Carbon Society. City to city collaboration is a driver, driving force to accelerate climate change actions. For example, Cooperation between Tokyo Metropolitan Government and Kuala Lumpur on climate policies become a factor to encourage Kuala Lumpur to preach a decarbonization by 2050. Collaboration with Kitakyushu City and also encourage net zero goal setting of Haiphong City of Vietnam. Japanese government plans to de designate 100 decarbonized leading areas by 2030 and supported the designated areas financially and technically. By now, 20, 46 areas were designated. It is interesting to note that criteria of selection leading areas emphasize revitalization of local economies and increase of local resilience as important elements of the climate actions. Regarding action at the local levels, I want to emphasize the uh, importance of the voluntary local review, VRRs, on the SDGs. More cities in the region published their VR reports in since 2018 with support of the international organization, cities networks, and research institute, uh, institute including UNED ESCAP and IGES. According to the IGES state's uh, VR report, Asia and the Pacific is the second largest region in the number of the published VRs by 20, June, June 2021. VLR can facilitate integrated policy planning, better data management, and stakeholder engagement. VLR can facilitate multi-national learning and among cities. I would like to stress that VLR is a prom promising tool to promoting and strengthening sustainable development at the local level. And also, I would like to need, uh, the emphasize the need of the national, regional, and international supports in implementations and shared lessons of the VLRs. Environmental, data, environmental development challenges in the regions are becoming more complex and interlinked each other, and therefore cannot be accomplished by one city or one, uh, one country. It requires concerned efforts of the regional internationals at the levels. So the region has already plenty of good practices and solutions are already in our hands. I would like to conclude my statement by emphasizing the importance of multilateral and multi-level actions toward our common goals. Thank you very much. On behalf of the committee, let me thank you, Ms. Kadoka, for the insights and recommendations for action. May, now, may I now invite Dr. Mina Bilgi, core associate, Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management, to take the floor. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for this opportunity and dear colleagues. Here I present on behalf of Asia-Pacific Regional CSO Engagement Mechanism. The platform is initiated, owned, and driven by the civil society organizations and has established a model of regional partnership capable of both enhancing accountability to citizens and supporting the... Just a second and supporting the local and powerful social movements dedicated to advancing development justice. We continue to assess efforts to achieve sustainable development through the lens of development justice, a model demanded by RCEM members that requires redistributive justice, economic justice, environmental justice, gender and social justice, and accountability to the people. The Asia-Pacific region has made significant progress over the last decade to improve the well-being and health of its population. However, several key issues persist, driven by the ongoing environmental crisis. 
the environment and development policy areas are grave and require accelerated attention with respect to climate action, environmentally sustainable economic growth, environmental quality and securing ecosystem services, people, human security and environment, and sustainable urban development. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the region's pre-existing social, economic, and environmental vulnerabilities, and the consequences of the pandemic continue to pose a critical threat. The war in Ukraine has further deepened the threats on food security through disruption to food supply chains, increased food prices, and loss of income. Human rights violations and environmentally destructive practices are often committed with impunity by large corporations, elites, and other power holders with the support or complicity of state forces. The environmental crisis undermines hard-won development gains and increases societal inequalities by burdening the poor and groups of people in vulnerable situations, including the women, children, and youth, indigenous population, minorities, migrants, displaced people, stateless people, older persons, and persons with disabilities. There have been more than 70,000 references to nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions since 2009 Copenhagen COP, where it emerged by a proposal of IUCN. Since then, the discussion has proliferated over all UN platforms, UNFCCC, UNCBD, UNCCD, and the HLPF. Even before it was acclaimed, and now has sort of intergovernmental consensus adopted on the EU resolution on NBS during the Union 5 in February 2022. 15 years of history of Red Plus is enough evidence to show that it has failed to prevent deforestation, fared extremely poor in benefit sharing, and led to displacement and dislocation of the communities. Investigation in the first Red Plus project in Meghalaya, India, clearly showed that beyond the hundreds of thousands of US dollars exchanged hands every year, 10 indigenous people's committees, which had sole or ownership of the forest, faced many disadvantages in the form of loss of access, livelihoods, and ownership for a pittance. C4, while reviewing 10 years of the Red Plus, commented that the Red Plus have failed in achieving its primary objectives. This has been attested by academic and uh, CSO's literature. The Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy has documented how small farmers in the first agricultural carbon project in Kenya, promoted by World Bank's biocarbon facility, were deceived to give up their land and sovereignty for a pittance. A recent paper on so-called community-supported agriculture projects in India show that there has been no concrete ecological benefits, high cost for small farmers, for no-till agriculture, and, and income benefits, if at all, accruing only to the middle and the large farmers. As a matter of fact, CSA, or no-till agriculture has only benefited Monsanto company with disastrous results from Argentina to USA and from Canada to Australia. The CSOs all along have been asking for strong social and environmental safeguards in these projects, which have thus far remained completely self-labeled. They need to be embedded with justice, equity, gender equality, participation, and community ownership to be appealing for local communities and to become a meaningful tool in reducing carbon emissions, protecting forest and biodiversity, enhancing resilience, and reducing the vulnerability of communities which are on the losing side of the crisis. Assimilating ecosystem-based approaches and uh, are nestly committed to do no harm to the people and the nature stand a better chance rather than those rooted in corporate greenwash. Many of the environmental crises are transboundary in nature 
and present significant challenges to all countries in the region. The sources of air pollution often, often originate outside the areas of impact. Ecosystems and ecosystem services are not constraints by borders and require coordinated action across local and national jurisdiction. And we know that climate change is a global issue. A special fund for loss and damage mark an important point of progress in COP27. But we must be able to differentiate between the environmental harm done locally versus the harm done somewhere else, either by an inappropriate action or no action. We all know the challenge. We must adjust our posters to become more proactive and self-determined. The government actions, regional cooperation initiatives, and support of development partners must come together in a new interconnected ways to deliver sustained outcomes for the new reality in the Asia-Pacific region. We need cooperation that plays people's interests and needs at the center of development. Encourage people to people solidarity and cooperation and develop mutual aid among communities within the countries through the realization of genuine reform. We must, we support strategic, creative, flexible and practical approaches to strengthen and scale up sub-regional cooperation and lines of actions to revitalize multilateralism, solidarity, information, data sharing, transparency and evidence for action. Accountability measures and financing, especially for the most vulnerable, the poor, the women and youth, and coordinated networked participatory action. Thank you so much. On behalf of the committee, may I thank you, Dr. Bilgi, for your perspectives. May, now, may I now invite Mr. David McLachlan Carr, Regional Director, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, UN Development Coordination Office, Asia Pacific Development Cooperation Office, to take the floor. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellencies, colleagues, good morning. Secretary General Antonio Guterres emphasized at the last UN General Assembly that the climate crisis is the defining issue of our time. He also said and warned that the clock is ticking and we are running against time. Since human activity is the cause of the climate problem, so human, human action must be the solution. We need urgent action to re-establish ambition and take concrete actions to rebuild trust in our collective capacities to respond to this monumental climate challenge. Given the increasing urgency and the complexity of environmental and development challenges facing the region, enhanced regional cooperation and a reinvigorated multilateralism are critical paths for advancing progress. In fact, in his report entitled Our Common Agenda, Secretary General Guterres uh, urged inclusive, networked and coordinated multilateralism, including for the promotion of a healthy environment as a global public good. The Asia and the Pacific region remains particularly vulnerable to the effects of the triple planetary crisis, that is the threats of global warming, biodiversity loss and pollution. Our region is home to six of the top 10 global emitters of greenhouse gases and six of the countries that will be the most affected by climate change across the planet. The heavy concentration of global population in Asia and the high level of climate vulnerability in the Pacific exacerbate the socioeconomic impacts of climate change. In particular, the small island developing states, the SIDS, face unique challenges. These include insularity, vulnerability to climate change and shock, uh, extreme weather events and proneness to severe shock given the small uh, scales of economic production and high reliance on imports. It's becoming uh, particularly evident that climate change poses the single most important threat to the economies in this region. The, resilient, the, re, the reliance on fossil fuels has not only led to increased emissions, but also puts millions of lives at risk and ex, uh, for their exposure to air pollution. No country, no single country, can deal with these threats alone, and we need much more concerted action everywhere, anchored in a respect for international law and the protection and promotion of human rights. 
With the adoption of the General Assembly Resolution on the Right to Safe, Healthy and Sustainable Environment, um, we, it's clear that we should be working together for a framework to set the baselines and quantify the investments countries will need to become the duty bearers to enable people to exercise these rights. The agreement reached at COP27 for the establishment of a loss and damage fund, which our, our colleague has just mentioned, must not make us complacent. Governments must be able to distinguish between environmental harm done locally versus the adverse impact caused by the absence of or inadequate action somewhere else and seek justice through international uh, mechanisms. Supporting countries to lift their ambition in responding to the climate crisis is a top, top priority for my office and the United Nations in general. Recently, we were able to secure funds to embed senior advisors to advise country teams on the triple planetary crisis from the DCO regional offices. Their main role is to support UN country teams uh, to conduct integrated analyses on climate biodiversity and pollution in the national socioeconomic context and provide insights on how environmental issues affect economic development and people's lives so that concrete actions can be taken by governments within the context of the national development cooperation frameworks. We're very proud in Asia Pacific to have been the pilot to have our climate advisor from Pakistan uh, to develop a global initiative uh, on the Living Indus program for the Indus River. We're also now looking at Samoa at, develop, at developing an integrated approach to the triple planetary crisis applied to both geography and national resources in the Pacific. At the regional level, the issues-based coalition on, rise, on raising ambition on climate change has mobilized and coordinated the regional response to the challenges of climate change and air pollution. And this coalition sustains political momentum uh, by identifying technical solutions to support countries to phase out coal, focusing in particular on just transitions in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. For example, the IBC developed tools to expand nationally determined contribution ambitions towards developing new sectors such as green jobs, uh, more sustainable land use and agriculture, and on human mobility and migration. As part of its direct country support, the regional coalition conducted a joint mission uh, in recent months to Mongolia and in consultation with the UN country team prepared an integrated package of support to initiate the SDG 7 roadmap. The roadmap will be based on scenario-based energy modelling and analysis to inform the best possible energy transition pathway for Mongolia, and we hope to do this in other countries as well. Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, re responding to the climate crisis must be the first priority of every government and multilateral organisation. There is indeed overwhelming public support for action, especially amongst youth. And we can expect that the Youth Summit next year, this will be a major subject that will be discussed. All we need now is the political will to act. Asia and the Pacific has immense opportunities to invest in solutions that lead to sustainable economic growth. For example, in renewable energies. We know it generates three times more jobs, is already cheaper than fossil fuels, and is the pathway to energy security, stable prices, and the development of new and exciting and innovative industry. But we need collective action to make this shift, including through international coalitions to allow scientific knowledge transfer and support to create just energy transitions in key emerging economies. Resilience building in developing countries is also a smart investment in reliable supply chains, regional stability and orderly migration. Almost all UN cooperation frameworks in the region are now prioritising building resilience as one of the key outcomes and goals. Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I will end my speech on a positive note. We already know what to do and we have the financial and technological tools to get the job done. A window of opportunity remains opened, but the shaft of light narrows every day. The global climate battle will be won or lost on this crucial decade uh, coming forward. So let me assure you that the United Nations, through our country teams in the region, remain a very strong ally in our collective fight. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. On behalf of the committee, may I thank you, uh, Mr. McLachlan-Carr, for your uh, insights. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, uh, on your behalf, I would like all of us to thank all our discuss discussions this morning for their contributions 
And uh, we shall now proceed to agenda item uh, two, hearing uh, interventions. Uh, Excellencies, I will uh, open the floor to statements from members, associate members, and observer countries. I will then invite statements from intergovernmental, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and other entities following those statements. So I open the floor for statements. I have a list in front of me here. Uh, if I can start with the distinguished uh, permanent representative of China to ESCAP. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, for the past five years, ESCAP has been in the world's climate 治理空气污染，保护海洋生态，发展可持续农业机械化等各个领域，积极促进区域合作。中方对此表示肯定。中国贯彻落实生态文明建设，始终坚持“绿水青山就是金山银山”的理念，促进经济社会发展全面绿色转型。努力建设天然、地绿、水清的美丽中国。上个月，习近平总书记在中国共产党的二十大报告中，深刻阐述了中国式现代化五个方面的特点，其中一个重要的方面就是人和自然和谐共生的现代化。主席先生，中国积极应对气候变化。促进绿色发展。十年来，中国是全球能耗强度降速最快的国家之一，超额完成了到二零二零年碳排碳排放强度下降百分之四十至百分之四十五的目标。中国确定了力争二零三零年实现碳达峰，二零六零年前实现碳中和的目标。是基于推动构建人类命运共同体和实现可持续发展做出的重大战略决策。中国承诺实现从碳达峰到碳中和的时间，远远短于发达国家所使用的时间。我们将经历一场广泛、深刻、系统性的经济社会变革，但中国。有信心和决心落实目标。中国积极参与 s c a p 环境与发展领域的合作，加强政策沟通，促进环境保护与发展。主席先生，环境问题是共同的、现实的，带给人类的挑战也是严峻的、长远的。我们要坚持多边共识，加强互信合作。摒弃单边主义和绿色壁垒，促进环境与发展平衡推动。我们要聚焦务实行动，在共同但有区别的原则基础上，推进气候变化行动，同时为发展中国家应对气候变化提供更多的资金、技术和能力建设支持。我们要务实推进绿色转型，应结合各国国情和发展水平，制定国家政策与规划。要在可持续发展的框架下，推进高质量公正转型。主席先生，中方将继续支持 s c a p 环境与发展领域的工作，持续推进。全球发展倡议和共建“一带一路”合作，为区域可持续发展做出积极贡献。
中方愿与各方一道，深化绿色发展，推进气候变化、能源安全等领域的务实合作，合力保护人类共同的地球家园。谢谢主席先生。I thank the distinguished delegate of China for his intervention. May I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate of the Republic of Korea, whom I understand is joining us online. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to take this opportunity to share Korea's ongoing efforts, as Korea has set up a number of policies to take the lead in implementing the commitment within the Ministerial Declaration of 2017 to contribute to addressing the harmful effects of climate change through enhanced climate actions. As a start, last year at UNFCCC COP26, Korea announced a significant increase in its 2030 NEC to 40%. Since then, Korea has been building a strong institutional foundation to achieve a reduction goal as well as carbon neutrality by 2050, including the enactment of the Carbon Neutrality Act. In addition, we have set up the Climate Response Fund to foster low carbon industry ecosystems through mobilizing financial resources. We have also introduced policy measures such as the Climate Impact Assessment and Climate Responsive Budgeting Program so that our national planning and fiscal system are better aligned to a carbon neutral vision. Meanwhile, Korea developed its its own green taxonomy, a K taxonomy, to facilitate private investment in green economic activities, which would be an experience willing to share. Now, Korea is developing our 2030 NDC implementation roadmap and a 20 year national plan for carbon neutrality, with which development and implementation of relevant policy programs will be accelerated. With air pollution, Korea is closely working with SCAP members to jointly address the challenge, especially dust and sandstorm during the spring season. Korea, China, and Japan have been jointly addressing the DSS issue under the Tripartite Environment Minister's Meeting Mechanism through operating two DSS research working groups, respectively on monitoring and forecasting and ecological restoration in source areas with China, Russia, and Mongolia. Together, we have built the Northeast Asia Desertification and Degradation Drought Network and exchanged relevant policies information through meetings and forums, even promoting cooperative projects to reduce and prevent DSS dry areas. We could proudly share that through the cooperation a total of 3,000 hectare forests have been newly created in Mongolia, along with capacity building programs such as forest expert training being conducted. Korea will keep on working together with neighboring countries through international programs to address air pollution such as DSS and PM2.5 for cleaner air in the region. Thank you, Chair. I thank the distinguished uh, delegate from the Republic of Korea for her intervention. May I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate of the Republic of Indonesia, uh, whom I understand is also joining us online. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, distinguished Chair, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We've seen the adoption of the Ministerial Declaration in 2017. Indonesia has documented significant progress and achievement that has since been made at the local, national, and regional level. Indonesia has long-standing commitment in pursuing a sustainable and life of the planet, despite the remaining challenge of balancing natural resources management and meeting development needs while minimizing GHG as low as possible. In response to this challenge, the two main sectors that are being pushed to reduce emission GXG emission are the forestry and other land use or follow sector, as well as energy sector. In, in 2020, 
15. The government of Indonesia pledged to reduce emission by 29% unconditionally from 2020 until 2030 and up to 45% with the support from the international partners against the 2030 business as usual scenario. In making further and more ambitious progress, Indonesia has revised revised and strengthen its 2030 target and its enhanced national determined contribution NDC as part of the global effort necessary to align with the Paris Agreement temperature goal. Indonesia has prom promulgated a presidential regulation in 2021 concerning the implementation on, of carbon pricing to achieve the national determined contribution target and control of our greenhouse emission in the national development. This regulation serves as a legal framework, framework to implement NDC fully and effectively toward low carbon and climate resilience through carbon pricing, arrangement for carbon trading, carbon levy, as well as result-based payments. Recently, during the 2020 uh, during 2032 G20 Bali Summit on 5th and 16th uh, November 2032, Indonesia has successfully launched a landmark joint energy transfer transition partnership that pursue a just and ambitious power sector transition in Indonesia, support, supporting a trajectory consistent with the keeping the 1.5 the Celsius global warming limit with rates. Through this partnership, Indonesia will work with the support from international partners to develop a comprehensive investment plan to achieve a significant new target and policy to reduce GXG uh, emission and support impacted community. Recognizing the importance of harnessing the ocean climate nexus to foster climate change mitigation and adaptation, Indonesia strives to safeguard the ocean capacity to regenerate in order to deliver substantial economic, environmental, and social value and offer powerful solutions to global challenges. Our presidency of the G20 continues the legacy of centering G20 priorities on ocean emphasis the importance of accelerating the implementation of SDG 14 on conserving and sustainably use of the world ocean, seas, and marine resources by inter alia reiterate commitment to combat IEUU fishing and marine litter. On the front of marine litter, Indonesia has launched its plan of Action on marine plastic debris 2015-2025, aiming to reduce marine plastic debris by 70% in 2025 through the adoption of five main pillars and implementation of five strategies centered around awareness arising of stakeholder, plastic waste management from land to coastal area improving marine plastic debris management and enhancing institutional capacities and funding support. Zooming out from marine litter to greater land-based sources of pollution, Indonesia strives to contribute in regional effort on addressing these challenges by establishing the Regional Capacity Center for Clean Seas, RG3S, to reduce and mitigate land-based sources of marine pollution, with particular focus on nutrient, wastewater, marine litter, and microplastic. The RC3S has been involved in UNSK project, using the loop implemented in Surabaya City to reduce its environmental impact by addressing waste pollution in the marine environment by using technology, technological advancement to help monitor and visual, visualize plastic waste leakage timing for better and improved management. Considering Indonesian ASEAN chairman in 2020 
We are looking forward to leverage these modalities to advance the coastal and marine agenda in the region, supporting the full and effective implementation of ASEAN Regional Action Plan for combating marine debris in the ASEAN member state. On pursuit of the 2040 vision of living in harmony with nature, Indonesia stands ready to advance the progress in finalizing and adopting post 2020 global biodiversity framework at the second part of COP 15 CBD as a strong framework of action and accountability for halting and reserving, reversing biodiversity the loss by 2030. And as appropriate, updating our national biodiversity strategy and action plans accordingly. Biodiversity conservation has been mainstream in our medium term national development plan and acknowledged as crucial natural, natural resources to be maintained and sustainable, sustainability used to increase added value competencies of the nation and increase the national development capacity in the future. I would like to conclude my intervention by underlining, underlining the need for a stronger collective action and collaboration by building on strength and success in dealing, in dealing with various challenges in the past and that lies ahead of us. Let us keep our spirit of cooperation high by intensifying dialogues, sharing of knowledge and best practices, capacity building, as well as technology development and transfer for further innovation. Thank you, Chair. I thank the distinguished delegate of the Republic of Indonesia for his uh, intervention. Now may I give the floor to the distinguished delegate of the Russian Federation. You have the floor, sir. Спасибо. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые делегаты, Российская Федерация выступает за последовательное расширение сотрудничества по вопросам охраны окружающей среды и устойчивого развития в целях реализации экологически ориентированных установок повестки 2030 в соответствии с программными документами комиссии в этой области. Uh, documents of the commission. Общая ситуация в мире наглядно демонстрирует, какое огромное значение для благополучия человечества и состояния окружающей среды имеют вопросы объединения усилий при поддержке, всех, при поддержке всех основных групп и других заинтересованных major groups and other stakeholders на объединительной платформе для решения возникающих и обостряющихся уже имеющихся экологических проблем. Это говорит нам о чем? Это говорит нам о том, что сотрудничество Азиатско-Тихоокеанского региона по сбережению экосистем региона в целях снижения негативного антропогенного воздействия на окружающую среду, которое нарушает экологический баланс, имеет стратегический характер. Поэтому важно и дальше работать на укрепление духа конструктивного э, сотрудничества. И мы в этой связи подчеркиваем ключевое целеположение, содержащееся в проекте Министерской декларации, которую мы, я надеюсь, примем по итогам работы комитета в этом году. Я имею в виду э, то положение, которое касается э, солидарности и объединения усилий государств на основе многосторонних подходов. Что бы еще хотелось сказать? 
Нам кажется важным последовательно наращивать уже имеющиеся достижения эската в налаживании региональных связей для решения тех проблем, о которых мы все знаем. И то, что мы часто говорим об этих проблемах, не должно нас приводить к заключению, что это что-то уже старое, неважное. Эти проблемы чрезвычайно важны для региона. Сохранение экосистемы биоразнообразия. Устойчивое управление природными ресурсами. Борьба с загрязнением воздуха. Климат. Я поставил климат на последнее место по порядку, но не по значимости. Мы, Российская Федерация, активно поддерживаем сотрудничество на международном и региональном уровне в сфере противодействия изменению климата и адаптацию к нему. Путем реализации адресных проектов технического содействия Российская Федерация активно содействует работе ЭСКАТА по оказанию экспертной помощи странам-членам в выполнении обязательств Парижского соглашения. Осмелюсь сказать, что итоги последней конференции сторон Парижского соглашения и рамочной конвенции ООН об изменении климата и UNFCCC я бы не назвал впечатляющими. Да, создан фонд по компенсации убытков и ущерба, loss and damage, фонд по компенсации убытков. Но не надо обманываться. Деньги не купят спасительный билет в лучшее климатическое будущее. Climatic future. Требуется добиваться реального объединения всех сторон э, рамочной конвенции по изменению климата и э, Парижского соглашения. Развитых и развивающихся стран. Последняя конференция в Шар-Мальшейхе ничего не добавила в направлении того, чтобы можно было говорить реально об объединении усилий. для принятия значимых действий по снижению климатической нагрузки на, землю, на климат Земли. Уважаемый господин председатель, я бы хотел очень коротко, только одним тезисом, отметить также субрегиональные аспекты работы ЭСКАТа. Не надо о них забывать. Это очень важный элемент работы ИСКАТа. Разумеется, я прежде всего хотел бы выделить субрегиональную программу по природоохранному сотрудничеству в Северо-Восточной Азии. Не СПЕК. Там ведется весьма перспективная проектная деятельность. Там делаются проекты, имеющие реальное значение для улучшения экологической обстановки на Земле. Это то, что называется политика реальных дел. Не красивых слов, а шаг за шагом реальных дел. Улучшение состояния охраняемых территорий природных. Сохранение амурских тигров и дальневосточных леопардов. Вот из таких дел складывается общее благополучие, к которому мы все стремимся в области окружающей среды. 
В заключение. В заключение. Мы надеемся, что министерская декларация, которая будет принята по итогам комитета, и программа действий по защите воздушной среды, они придадут новый импульс работе комитета. Дадут толчок разработке государственными членами конкретных действий в том, что касается, как я сказал, защиты воздушной среды. Решению конкретных проблем, связанных с чрезвычайными ситуациями природного характера. Natural uh, да, именно. Мы часто говорим о чрезвычайных ситуациях, но мы забываем о чрезвычайных ситуациях природного характера. Uh, деградация земель, которая ведет uh, к оползням, к песчаным бурям. Landslides and sandstorms. И мы там увидели недавние свидетельства, если взять то, что произошло в Италии. Да, это не наш регион, но это, это то, что мы все видим. И сокрушительное землетрясение в Индонезии, вопросы подготовки к чрезвычайным ситуациям. Все это тоже имеет отношение к экологическому благополучию. Смысл того, что я хочу сказать, это значение конкретных дел шаг за шагом на общей объединительной платформе, оставляя в стороне красивые лозунги и э, красивые слова. Мы хотели бы отметить, что реализация стоящих перед миром и в частности АТР – Задач зависит прежде всего от политической воли государств и их лидеров. Политической воли государств и их лидеров. Воли, подтвержденной не лозунгами в выступлениях с трибуны Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН, а реальными делами. И дело здесь, я завершаю, это последнее, что я хотел сказать, прежде всего, за перестройкой политической ментальности мировых элит. Спасибо. Japan regards climate change as one of the biggest challenges to overcome, not just regionally but globally, in, in our effort to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and to accelerate the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 in alignment with those long-term objectives. Building on the outcomes of COP27, we will continue to work on climate change mitigation among other environmental issues and call upon all member states to take further action in line with achieving the 1.5 degrees target. Japan stresses the importance of international collaboration in this area. Japan has consi consistently been a large donor to facilitate these efforts in developing countries, particularly in this region. These efforts continue. At COP26, we have announced our plans to mobilize public and private financing of up to $70 billion over the five-year period through 2025, including our intention to more than double financing toward climate adaptation to about $15 billion. Japan has also pledged about $3 billion to the Green Climate Fund to actively support mitigation measures in developing countries, including small island developing states and LDCs. Furthermore, we remain the largest donor to the GEF, uh, on, uh, these in, including on these initiatives. Japan stands ready to continue to assist in capacity development related to these efforts. Japan will continue to place pri primary importance on pursuing multilateral co cooperation in these common global uh, problems, including on air pollution, and pursue this via existing multilateral mechanisms in an open and transparent manner. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished delegate of Japan for her intervention. 
distinguished delegates, excellencies, would you have any further representative, any representative who wishes to speak? Tajikistan, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, as you know, uh, 93 percent of Tajikistan is a mountainous area, and uh, it is, uh, uh, and uh, Tajikistan is the uh, most vulnerable country to climate change. So, and uh, natural disasters, you know, associated with this process annually cause hundreds of millions uh, of uh, dollars, I mean U.S. dollars, damage to our national economy. So, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the share, uh, uh, let me uh, just to bring to attention, of your attention, the, the share of uh, Tajikistan in, glo in global uh, emissions is very low. It is miserably, I think, uh, zero point triple zero three, it's like that. It is very miserable. But despite that, uh, Tajikistan making efforts in uh, uh, in, in uh, increasing it is uh, renewable energy potential. Uh, we, we have a, a huge uh, hydro energy potential. 60% uh, of the water resources in, in Central Asia is generated in Tajikistan, 60%. It is also from glaciers, from snow, from mountains, from other uh, sources. So uh, with regard to this, uh, we initiated, actually it is our, it is the fifth initiative of Tajikistan. So uh, as you might be aware now, uh, was uh, pre-approved in, in the in second committee in 77th session of General Assembly. And I hope it will be approved in the General Assembly by the end of the year. So uh, it is of proclaiming uh, two, uh, the year 2015, uh, 25, uh, a year of preservation of glaciers and uh, proclaiming 21st of March as a day, as a glaciers day. And uh, it was, it, it uh, there, is, there is resolution and envisage uh, also establishing of a trust fund, which will be managed by Secretary, UN Secretary General and uh, WMO, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So, and there are some other, uh, important uh, paras in this resolution. So, uh, with uh, regard to the CD7, seven, seven session, so this, uh, the outcome document, I mean draft outcome document, it is, uh, there are some sound uh, ambitions, commitments, but, you know, the important thing is its uh, implementation, of course. We, we, uh, we announce ambitions because if we, if we recall, you know, the Earth Summit, 1992. But before that, I think it was Tbilisi Declaration first. This issue, uh, it takes us to 1960s, you know, so many declarations uh, and so many uh, commitments. Uh, and uh, the recently this Paris Agreement and uh, the outcome of the COP26. Th this is the most important, this is our collective uh, uh, collaboration, our taking collective measures. So uh, I hope, uh, I, I wish uh, to us uh, 
uh, success uh, to this to see this successful uh, uh, outcome. And uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the distinguished delegate of uh, Tajikistan for his uh, intervention. Uh, distinguished uh, colleagues and excellencies, that uh, brings us to to the last uh, member state uh, speaker uh, requesting for the floor. Now I will move on to the interventions by international organizations and NGOs and other entities. I will start with the distinguished uh, representative of the UN Habitat. You have the floor, ma'am. Okay, um, I don't see the representative here. So can we move on to the second intervention by the International Federation of Social Workers? You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, I represent the International Federation of Social Workers, which is the global professional body for social workers. With over 143 member countries representing over 3 million social workers globally, we are on the front lines of human rights and social protection with a shared commitment to human rights, self-determination, social and environmental justice. We commend the UN, SCAP and the committee for its commitment to climate action and achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We need immediate, transparent and accountable climate action from member states. The changes confronting our environment because of global warming are already profound and extensive, making climate policy a pressing responsibility for member states, especially in the Asia Pacific region. As the 2022 review of the implementation of the Ministerial Declaration on Environment and Development for Asia Pacific highlights, there is an urgent need to advance progress on environment and development challenges in the region. Central to this is focusing on the role of civil society, including social workers, in enhancing cooperation, supporting strengthened public collective action and providing a platform for listening to people and community voices. Meaningful contributions of civil society movements are pivotal if we are going to address these existential challenges. The People's Charter for an Eco-Social World is a clear example of this. The People's Charter comes from this year's People Global Summit, which was initiated by 26 diverse global organisations representing hundreds of millions of people, representing different faiths, philosophies, right movements, workforces, generations, traditions and cultures. The summit gathered people from across the world to create new ways to work together for sustainability and quality of life for all. The People's Charter for an Eco-Social World was a result of this event and proposes a new way forward with solutions to our joint challenges so all people can live with confidence, security and peace in a sustainable world. As the Charter states, this can only be achieved through co-developing reciprocity and joint ownership of positive change, co-building peace, co-living with nature, co-creating social justice and co-realising equality. We encourage member countries and member states to read the Charter and work with us to achieve these aims. As a core part of our practice, social workers understand that meaningful social and environmental action can only be achieved if people's voices are heard and, and they have influence over their own lives. As social workers, we work with communities who are hardest hit by climate change, and we appreciate that while climate change is affecting the entire population, the social, health and economic burden is falling most heavily on already marginalised people. Climate action requires whole of society approach and member states must be willing to develop meaningful partnerships to collectively achieve climate action, social justice, inclusive democracy and, just, and social just transformation for equality and rights. Thank you. I thank the representative of the International Federation of Social Workers for his intervention. Is there any other representative who wishes to speak? I see none, so on your behalf, let me thank you all for all the insightful remarks and for the excellent interventions that has been made contributing to this uh, session. Before we adjourn for lunch, 
May I invite the Secretary to provide further details on the logistics and make any housekeeping announcements? You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, in efforts to provide additional space for member states, civil society, UN agencies, and other stakeholders to share knowledge products and showcase good practices on issues of concern. So we are pleased to announce two side events taking place today at 12.30 to 13.50 before agenda item three. The first side event, Asia Pacific Finance Roundtable, organized by Alexis Foundation, will take place in meeting room A, meeting room A, uh, level, uh, for level one below this, this room, and also online. So link to join will be provided uh, in the chat box. So those who wish to join uh, from June, please check the chat box. And the second side event, uh, managing the risk uh, temperature overshot in Asia Pacific, organized by Energy and Resource Institute, the Terry, and the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative at the UNCC uh, theater on the ground floor and also online. Also, light uh, refreshment is sponsored by Terry and C2G. Link to join will be also provided on the chat box. There will be our colleagues uh, outside of the conference room who can help guide you to this side event venue. And as you may have already seen, there are uh, exhibition booths. So one is Black Carbon by French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development. Also, there is also booths for chemicals and pollution by AIT and UNEP, and innovative solution on climate action and youth engagement by Alexis Foundation, and UNUS in Thailand, uh, climate action sustainability transition by uh, ESCAP EDD. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Secretariat, Excellencies, and distinguished delegates. We will resume deliberations at 1400 hours uh, Bangkok time. The afternoon session will be chaired by Ms. Huda Ali Sarif, the permanent representative of the Republic of Maldives to ESCAP. The meeting is adjourned. Recording stopped.
Recording in prog.
Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the meeting is called to order. We shall proceed now with the consideration of agenda item three, protecting our planet through regional cooperation and solidarity in Asia and the Pacific. The documents pertinent to this agenda item are protecting our planet through regional cooperation and solidarity in Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash two. Terms of reference of the technical ex expert group on environment and development, ESCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash three. Operationalizing the environment health nexus in Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash INF slash one. Sustainable mechanization-based solutions for climate smart agriculture and in Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP slash CED slash 2022 INF slash two, and trends in and impacts of urbanization in Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP slash CED slash 2022 INF slash three. In this session, the senior officials may wish to provide their comments regarding the issues raised in these documents and provide guidance on the direction of work for the Secretariat. The session will start with a short statement by Ms. Poonam Gimea, youth member of the UN High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism and Climate Activist. I would now like to invite the Secretariat to play her recorded intervention. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, honorable representatives, and leaders from the Asia and the Pacific. First of all, it is my great pleasure to be speaking to you today about how we can work together across Asia and the Pacific to foster sustainable and equitable development. I'm especially honored to be addressing you on behalf of these regions, young people who come from diverse backgrounds, but are united in their commitment to tackle the planetary crisis. As we all know, Asia Pacific is the home to rich biodiversity and a vast abundance of natural resources, from tropical rainforest to marine products. And in recent years, our economic progress has been impressive. We are now seen as the growth center that can serve as the engine to the world economy. While we can be immensely proud of our natural capital and economic development, we must also be conscious about our contributions towards the environmental degradation. The Asia Pacific region emits 55% of the global greenhouse emissions, and that rapid and unplanned expansion across the region has led to biodiversity loss, poor waste management, and increased air and marine pollution. These are alarming findings for the whole Asia Pacific region, but especially for the 60% of the world's youth who call this region our home. Many of us will live to see the end of this century and our grandchildren will live far into the next. We are the ones to inherit the consequences of rapid environmental degradation that we see today. We are the ones who will bear the brunt of natural disasters live with poor air quality, and be forced to migrate to deal with the climate-related challenges. And we are the ones who will live to see the once beautiful ecosystem of this region fade away. Therefore, today on behalf of the young people of Asia and the Pacific, I urge you to commit to a clean, sustainable, and peaceful future, and crucially, to commit to, the, to working together towards creating that future. Effective regional cooperation to tackle environmental challenges will position Asia-Pacific region as the beacon of leadership and intergenerational solidarity. To that end, I present you four goals that hope the leaders of this region will work together to achieve. First, countries across the Asia and the Pacific must support an internationally legally binding instrument to end plastic pollution. Second, the region must accelerate efforts to research, develop, and sustain sustainable cities and communities. Third, the region must end fossil fuel subsidies immediately, leading the global transition towards clean energy. 
And fourth, I implore you to include diverse voices across all decision making and policy making processes, and especially the voices of those who are most vulnerable to the effects of environmental degradation, including young people. Not just because we have a right to environmental protection and a right to be heard, but because we can bring a vital energy and creativity to your efforts. Investment in youth delegates, youth advisors, youth councils, and youth parliaments is an investment in a better future for people and the planet. Asia Pacific region has already shown a great promise as a climate leader, as 40 member states have already placed carbon neutrality by 2050, 2060, or 2070, and have incorporated these commitments in their national planning. But we all know that a lot remains to be done. So rather than being overwhelmed, why not embrace cooperation across countries and the generations? It's a pathway to strengthen solidarity and progress. The future of our region is very bright with the booming economy and innovative young generation to take over. And now it's the time to fulfill our responsibilities towards the Mother Earth. I'm very hopeful that this meeting will produce innovative and bold commitments for implementation and prove the Asia Pacific region as the global guru on sustainability. Finally, I would like to wish you for this successful meeting from my side, as well as on behalf of the High Level Advisory Board and Effective Multilateralism. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Ms. Gimea, for this perspective from the youth on the topic at hand at this session. I would now like to invite the Secretariat to make a presentation on the issues concerning protecting our planet through regional cooperation and solidarity in Asia and the Pacific. I have the pleasure to invite Ms. Katinka Weinberger, Chief of Environment and Development Policy Section, ESCAP, to deliver the Secretariat presentation. The floor is yours, Katinka. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, distinguished delegates, dear participants. In preparation for this committee, um, the Secretariat has issued a flagship report entitled Protecting Our Planet Through Regional Cooperation and Solidarity in Asia and the Pacific, as summarized in CD 2022-2. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that the report preparation had benefited from discussions at the expert group meeting on regional cooperation to protect our common environment, which was held on 22 and 23 of June earlier this year. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share some key messages of the report in this meeting. The starting point of the report is that Asia Pacific faces a severe crisis in respect to its environment and that the harmful effects of climate change, of pollution, of environmental degradation are felt keenly across the entire region. Many of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change are located here. Indicators show that the region is experiencing the most severe decline in biodiversity and ecosystems as compared to other regions. We see that this environmental crisis hampers social and economic development. The exponential increases in air pollution levels, unsafe food, waste, are all examples that exacerbate public health challenges. And we know that the poor, and especially people in most vulnerable situations, are disproportionately burdened. Addressing these challenges requires joint and integrated action. Strong regional action is needed to protect our planet. The survey findings that were introduced in Agenda Item 2 emphasize that more focus is required on effective multilateralism. In other words, reinvigorated, effective, networked, and inclusive multilateralism. And based on the survey findings, we identified five key avenues for such multilateralism. Accountability measures, information and data sharing, transparency and evidence for action, economic systems and financing interventions, and coordinated, networked, and participatory action. Also, the fifth, solidarity as a critical dimension of enhanced collaboration 
given that the environmental crisis, as just mentioned, is most severely felt by vulnerable and marginalized groups in society. And this framework shapes recommendations for concrete policy actions across the five themes in the report around climate action, ecosystem health, air pollution, sustainable urban development, and environmental access rights. For example, in relation to the need for transition to low carbon transformation and scaling up of ambition in, re in respect to addressing the climate crisis. Many countries have not reached their potential in their commitments for greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and our research shows that conditional and unconditional NDC commitments and the regional GHG emission trajectories are projected to result in an increase of estimated greenhouse gas emissions reductions, uh, emissions, sorry. So to support a transition to low carbon transformations and to scale up ambitions, the report proposes the following actions the accelerating of energy transitions to realize the potential of energy and resource efficiency, the prioritization of ecosystem-based solutions for climate mitigations and adaptation, and enhancing national action and regional cooperation on raising climate ambitions in Asia and the Pacific. In respect to biodiversity and ecosystems actions, the report emphasizes the degradation in Asia and the Pacific is happening over a wide array of ecosystems, whether they're terrestrial or marine. And to advance biodiversity and ecosystem action, countries are called to strengthen policy coherence synergies and legal frameworks, promote sustainable land management and ensure transition to sustainable food systems, and also to take regional action to strengthen the sustainable management of ocean and marine ecosystems. The report highlights that pollution comes in many different forms and is a severe environmental hazard in Asia and the Pacific. Among the major concerns are increasing levels of air pollution, municipal solid waste, plastic pollution and marine litter, untreated wastewater, as well as chemical pollution in soils and waters. And again, the report identifies a number of concrete actions for stronger regional level cooperation to address in particular air pollution by improving air quality standards, facilitating air quality monitoring and open data sharing, exchanging best practices and outreach, facilitating capacity building and technical support for national action, and mobilizing commitment to multilateral cooperation. Rapid and unplanned urban expansion has resulted in sprawl, environmental degradation, loss of biodiversity, generation of large volumes of solid waste, and this while the region is projected to continue its urban growth over the next few decades. To advance sustainable urban development, the region can, con can consider actions in terms of integrating sustainability and well-being into inclusive urban planning, strengthening regional cooperation for sustainable infrastructure and housing, and promoting vertical integration of urban policies for livable cities. And finally, in respect to regional action to enhancing rice-based approaches, the research shows that many countries in our region still face challenges in achieving globally agreed environmental goals and in implementing principles on environmental rights at the national level. And there's a direct relationship between these two variables. The flagship report proposes to accelerate regional actions to enhance right-based approaches by establishing compliance and assistance mechanisms, by implementing the right to information measures to increase public participation, and by focusing both on substantive and procedural environmental rights to help reshape governance competence. In conclusion, there are really quite a number of opportunities for stronger regional cooperation and so collaboration and solidarity based on effective international environmental governance and multilateral processes. We suggest a focus on strengthening the social contract for delivering on environmental rights, as well as more attention towards holistic policies to effectively manage the environment health nexus, such as the One Health approach. And we firmly believe that the pandemic recovery offers an opportunity to ensure such wide and transformational shifts in policymaking. 
The Secretariat, of course, is committed to supporting member states in the implementation of the proposed recommendations and can support member states by facilitating, for instance, regional networks and platforms for the exchange of knowledge, experiences and good practices, as well as through technical support and capacity building. In closing, the committee may wish to provide guidance on regional cooperation and solidarity and take note of the proposals contained in the present document, especially in respect to strengthening multilateral action in the five key policy areas that were identified. May urge members and associate members to recognize the leadership of the potential. Uh, may take note of the current mandates of the Secretariat and recommend continued follow-up in close consultation with members and associate members and also recommend any other points of programmatic strengthening and guidance on activities and programs. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for the insightful presentation from the Secretariat. May I now invite uh, Ms. Alpana Dube as the chair of the working group which led the drafting of the terms of reference for the technical expert group on environment and development as contained in ESCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash three to take the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, representatives of non-governmental organizations, it is with great pleasure that I address you today as the chair of the working group of the Bureau of the Sixth Committee, which led the drafting of the terms of reference for the technical expert group on environment and development. I am grateful to the Bureau members, Indonesia and the Russian Federation for their participation in the working group meetings. You have document SCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash three entitled Terms of Reference of the Technical Expert Group on Environment and Development, which I will briefly summarize. A decision was taken by the Committee on Environment and Development at its sixth session held in December 2020 to establish within existing resources the Technical Expert Group on Environment and Development to enhance regional exchange and to mobilize technical expertise in support of the efforts of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific to accelerate environmental and sustainable development action. In that same decision, the committee requested the Secretariat to organize the preparation as appropriate of the terms of reference of the technical expert group and to submit them to member states for their consideration. The terms of reference were developed through a process of virtual and in-person meetings held following the last committee session and concluding as the preparatory process for this committee session was commencing. With the decision on the adoption of the TOR incorporated into this agenda item and the committee document referenced SCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash three. The terms of reference are tabled today for endorsement by the committee. The technical expert group is of critical importance to the work of SCAP on environment and development as it would support the implementation of relevant SCAP resolutions and the ministerial declarations on environment and development. Second, encourage the adoption of policies and mobilize technical expertise in support of efforts by SCAP to accelerate environmental and sustainable development action and Third, strengthen efforts to implement relevant SCAP resolutions on the environment and development through enhanced regional cooperation, including the sharing of best practices. In this context, the technical expert group should focus periodically on specific environmental issues identified in the ministerial declarations on environment and development for Asia and the Pacific and the thematic areas discussed during the session of the committee. The terms of reference include detail of these overall functions, the composition of the group, and rules of conduct. I would like to highlight just a few of the key functions of the technical expert group and how it will support the sub-program and SCAP's work on environment and development. The technical expert group will facilitate the exchange of information among experts from relevant ministries, public institutions, and relevant stakeholders and SCAP. 
the technical expert group will provide technical feedback and advice, and advice to the Environment and Development Division on opportunities to accelerate action and monitor progress in key environmental areas. And the technical expert group will provide feedback and advice on leveraging our intergovernmental processes to advance environmental action. Delegations have had opportunities to review the terms of reference and the committee may wish to consider today endorsing the terms of reference and requesting the Secretariat to organize a call for nominations for members and associate members in accordance with the committee's decision and to hold the first meeting of the technical expert group as soon as practicable. I thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Ms. Alpana Dube. Um, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I'm now pleased to invite the distinguished delegates to intervene on agenda item three. I will first open the floor to statements from members, associate members, and observer countries. Once all country statements have been made, I will invite statements from intergovernmental and international organizations and other entities. To begin, I would now like to open the floor for country statements. I recognize the distinguished delegate from Indonesia. Uh, the distinguished delegate from Indonesia, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Can you pick it up on my intervention from previous agenda item, which underlined the need for stronger collective action and collaboration. Let me re-emphasize the importance of intensifying dialogues, sharing of knowledge, and best practices, capacity building, as well as technology development and transfer to advance protection and safeguard of our planet. Embarking on the journey of sustainable recovery, protecting environmental health is critical aspect to recover together, recover stronger. The recent ISCAP report on shipping on shaping the future regional cooperation in Asia and Pacific, I highlighted that many forms of environmental degradation in Asia and the Pacific occur across boundaries and thus require enhanced regional cooperation. The report also highlights the countries in the region share many important terrestrial, freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems as well as the atmosphere and share the impact of the degradation, therefore an important aspect of protecting nature in Asia and the Pacific is collaboration. Moving on the establishment of the technical expert group on environment and development, uh, environment and development respond to this call and will serve, serve and facilitate this endeavor by enhancing regional exchange and mobilizing technical expertise in support of the effort of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific to accelerate environmental and sustainable development action. We will come the decision to establish the technical expert group during the last session, and we support and we are supportive of adoption of its term of reference during our session today. My appreciation goes to the Secretariat for the work in preparing the term of reference presented before the meeting. Indonesia is looking forward to nominate our experts to work and generate the transformational change required to reduce environmental degradation, friends and guide the longer term sustainable management of environment in Asia and Pacific region to strengthen action in the context of sustainable development and effort to eradicate property. Indonesia remains committed to cooperation among the and beyond members and other relevant stakeholders 
to address issues and challenges in five key policy area identified climate change, air pollution, urbanization, ocean, and ecosystem health, as well as environmental crime. We have highlighted some of our key policy program as well as initiative during our previous intervention, and we are looking forward to join take lead will all SCAP member is in pursuing goal and target on that front. We also endeavor for to enhance provision, provision and access to capacity building and technical assistance, technology transfer and financial resources for countries to be effectively implement plans and decision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Indonesia. Uh, on my list of requests, I have uh, Japan, India, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. So I would now like to invite the distinguished delegate of Japan. You have the floor. Actually, I didn't have my placard up, but I, I'd be happy to speak. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Unless some, I mean, I didn't have this vertical, so if I'm skipping other people. Oh, I'm just going through the, uh, the, on the, list, the list that was shared with me from the Secretariat, the list uh, request for the floor. So should I? <laughs> I didn't have my placard up. Uh, technical clarification from Secretary. So we have uh, received the, uh, the request from our member state I mean, representatives uh, for their plan for intervention. So we have collected and then we have shared the list of requests with the chair. So do you want me to speak? I mean, I can do that, but... Uh, y yes, please. <laughs> okay. yeah, <cool. laughs> uh, so Japan broadly agrees with the importance of multilateral actions to tackle environmental issues. As stated in our earlier interventions, we've demonstrated our commitment to take such actions via our active involvement in various existing multilateral processes and mobilizing support for capacity building and knowledge sharing. We agree that establishing compliance and assistance mechanisms are key. Um, <clears throat> domestically, uh, for example, there's us, we think that the central government can play a key role in developing a legal framework necessary to promote measures uh, for example, on climate change mitigation adaptation. In Japan, the Ministry of Environment actively supports local government's efforts in formulating regional adaptation plans based on Climate Change Adaptation Act by publishing a guide and dispatching experts from the National Institute for Environmental Study to local governments. Thus far, 46 out of 47 prefectures have already prepared their plans, and as a result, various adaptation measures are being implemented in accordance with their regional priorities. Uh, this can certainly be scaled up uh, as lessons to be learned up to other areas uh, through various knowledge, ex uh, knowledge exchange platforms. On ocean plastics, uh, Japan took the leadership in building the agreement on Osaka Blue Ocean Vision at the G20 in 2019, sharing and promoting this vision with 87 countries and regions thus far. Under the marine initiative of this blueprint, Japan has supported capacity building and infrastructure development related to waste management in developing countries, particularly in this region, training more than 17,000 waste management personnel to date. Japan will continue to cooperate with various organizations such as ESCAP to promote the urgency of tackling marine pl plastic pollutions in the Asia-Pacific region, including Southeast Asia. And needless to say, Japan has been active in participating in the negotiations towards a legally binding international agreement on plastic pollution. With the aim to complete negotiations by 2024, Japan hopes to contribute toward building a practical, effective, as well as progressive framework that, can be actively engaged, that could actively engage both consumers and producers of plastic wastes worldwide. Domestically, Japan's plastic recycling law has come into force this past April, enabling us to build a circular economy involving plastics from product design to waste management and reuse. We hope to be able to share lessons learned and knowledge on these matters with the region and support the establishment of the technical expert group with due consideration to avoid duplication of effort at other relevant fora. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Japan. 
Uh, next on my list is India. I'd like to invite the distinguished delegate from India to have, take, please take the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. At the outset, I thank the Secretariat for the preparation of the background documents for this committee meeting, which examines the major environmental challenges being faced by Asia-Pacific region, focusing on an air pollution, climate change, ocean and marine ecosystem, sustainable cities, etc., and presenting recommendations to address these challenges. Preservation of the environment has always been a central pillar of Indian civilization and culture. This has found reflection in the government's policies and programs, including the National Action Plan on Climate Change and the National Clean Air Program. Our Prime Minister had outlined at COP26 summit in Glasgow, India's commitment for scaling up climate action embodied in Panchamrit or a five-point action plan which includes achieving 500 gigawatt of installed power generation capacity from non-fossil fuel sources by 2030. India intends to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2070 and to meet 50% of its electricity needs from renewable sources by 2030. India has updated its mm -hmm. nationally determined contributions in August 2022 we have embarked on far-reaching new initiatives in renewable energy, e-mobility, ethanol blended fuels, and green hydrogen as an alternate energy source. India recognizes that new technologies play a crucial role in the development of affordable, accessible, and adaptable solutions in areas of low carbon development, renewable energy generation, and climate protection. The solar energy has in particular great potential to increase energy access foster economic development and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the region. India believes that the international community need to forge a comprehensive partnership to harness new technologies, policies, financing mechanisms, and economic incentives to reduce emissions. Among various initiatives, India launched the National Clean Air Program in January 2019 with an aim to improve air quality in 131 cities by engaging all stakeholders. The program envisages reducing by 20 to 30 percent in PM10 concentration over baseline in year 2017 by 2024. 95 cities have already improved air quality in financial year 2021-22 compared to base level of 2017. The proposed activities under NCAP program includes constitution of air quality management cell in 131 cities and nodal officers have been identified in all. Committees have been set up at national, state and city level for coordination, monitoring and evaluation of progress on action plan by various stakeholders and departments. A national knowledge network with experts from varied fields, NGOs and academia had been established and made operational to provide technical and knowledge support to the program at various levels. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change is also conducting regional workshops for sensitization, knowledge sharing and capacity building of the stakeholders. India has taken several initiatives to improve air quality. These include actions in the field of vehicular emission like enhancing the network of metro rails for public transport and covering more cities and faster adoption of manufacturing of electric vehicles, responding to industrial emission by implementing policies like stringent emission norms for coal-based thermal power plants and shifting of industrial units to piped natural gas, tackling air pollution caused due to dust and burning of waste and monitoring of ambient air quality. In addition, the government has released several schemes and incentives to improve air quality. Urban Swachh Bharat Mission 2.0 has been launched by the government for the period 2021 to 2026 with a special focus on source segregation of garbage, reducing in single-use plastic, and bioremediation uh, remediation of all legacy dump sites. Under the sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation scheme of the government, 5,000 compressed biogas production plants will be set up across the country for use in automotive fuels. To conclude, India reiterates its support to regional solidarity and cooperation to address the environmental challenges in the Asia-Pacific. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from India. Uh, next on my list is Sri Lanka, but the distinguished delegate from Sri Lanka is, I have been informed, is not available at the moment. So I would now like to invite the distinguished delegate from the Maldives to deliver your statement. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I take this opportunity to express sincere appreciation for the valuable reports and the presentation. Regional cooperation in the area of environmental conservation and management is an important topic for our delegation. As one of the most low-lying countries in the world, climate change poses a significant threat to our survival. Majority of our islands are one meter above sea level. With our planet heating up more than ever and a sea level rise, its impact have become a reality we face every day. Millions of dollars are spent to combat the impact of climate change in our country, but it does not guarantee our survival. A global collective effort by world governments and its citizens is required to tackle these issues effectively. In efforts, to, in efforts to curb domestic air pollution, the National Action Plan on Air Pollutant was formulated in 2019. We have established a real-time air quality monitoring system dispersed through the country. It is the collective accountability and collective action that we need to reduce air pollution. Maldives has also updated the nationally determined contribution in 2019, in which we have set forth ambitious plans to reduce 26% of our emission by 2030, contingent on adequate support which will be achieved through intervention in energy, transport and waste sec sectors. We are working on introducing integrated sustainable and low emission transport in the Maldives, installment of solar diesel hybrid system in several atolls. We have established 79 protected areas under the one island, one reef, one wetland from each atoll conservation policy and are continuing our works in to legally protect more areas. The Maldives believe that enhanced plans and coordinated efforts will lead our country to a net zero, sustainable, greener and a more resilient future. The government of Maldives is committed to offer its support in all efforts towards combating the three planetary crises. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from the Maldives. Uh, now I would like to invite the distinguished delegate from Fiji to deliver your statement. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to intervene and contribute to this agenda item three. I applaud the Secretariat for the flagship report entitled Protecting Our Planet Through Regional Cooperation and Solidarity in Asia and the Pacific, specifically supporting its recommendations, in particular identifying the critical environmental drivers of our planet and our society and human well-being. I wish to focus this intervention on climate change and oceans. Climate change remains our most existential threats, giving rise to sea level rise, loss of biodiversity, extreme weather events, and outbreaks of uncount uncountable diseases. As global carbon emissions are on the rise again, with our region collectively responsible for 55% of greenhouse gas emissions, and more so with a trend of continuous growth between 2010 to 2022, for us as small island developing states, this is a worrying trend because at this current trajectory, low-lying nations in the Pacific are likely to become uninhabitable under current emission scenarios by 2050. The report states that current emissions as set out in the collective NDCs fall short of what is required to reach the Paris Agreement targets. Pertaining to oceans, more must be done to address the rapid decline of our ocean's health and marine ecosystems. We need to ensure that nationally determined contributions concretely define ocean adaptation and mitigation commitments. It's unfortunate that only 20% of current NDCs have a blue component. And while we continue to talk about nature-based solutions, most national commitments do not reflect actions to support oceans in their climate goals. We must strengthen our commitment towards the Ocean Pathway Partnership to support the dedicated mandated uh, mandate created within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to address climate ocean issues. Fiji calls for bold leaderships of the region and by the region to advocate for reductions in current global emissions by 50% by 2030 in order for 1.5 degrees to remain a realistic target and moreover to enhance the resilience of our planet and society. 
In this connection, Fiji has enacted its Climate Change Act in September 2021. It is perhaps the most single, it is perhaps the single most comprehensive climate law developed by any small island developing state covering issues such as long-term net zero commitments, carbon budgets, carbon market establishment, climate-induced human mobility, nature-based solutions, legal, legally rec legal recognition of maritime boundaries relative to sea level rise, climate finance, and intergovernmental resilience building. In fact, Fiji is the only seventh country in the world to pass climate legisl legislation that includes net zero emissions goal. Despite contributing only 0.006% to total GHG emissions, we are walking the talk and demonstrating remarkable climate actions. This is what we expect from our, our Asia-Pacific region and the rest of the world. Finally, Chair, we are counting on our region to walk the talk, to support our call through strengthened multilateralism, for strong advocacy and support towards the measures identified in the report that are necessary to address the existential threats we are facing. In so doing, we are strengthening our common resolve to build resilience of our societies and planet before it is too late because charity begins at home. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Fiji. Next on my list is the distinguished, I would like to invite the distinguished delegate from the Convention on Biological Diversities Group. The people that we can check on. China, sorry. Uh, I, uh, before I give the floor to the uh, international organizations, I would not like to invite uh, China. Did would like to take the floor? Thank you, Chair, for giving me the uh, floor. Uh, first, of all, first of all, I would like to express some appreciation uh, for the Secretary for making a comprehensive uh, introduction about uh, the uh, implementation of the relevant work of the Division on Envir Environment and Development. Chair, on the 20th of November, COP27 has successfully concluded uh, with a series of positive uh, uh, results. And this meeting, uh, the wrap-up of this meeting, also reflects a positive signal uh, of the international society to address the climate challenge based on the multilateralism and solidarity and joint uh, efforts. Uh, all parties, I think, uh, in addressing uh, the climate change, we should focus now on actions, roadmaps, measures, and implementations, and also uh, should balanced propose the program, promote the progress in the areas of mitigation, adaptation, and technical and financial support. In the process of the uh, implementation, we should take full into consideration the principle of common but differential added responsibility and take into consideration the gap between uh, the developing countries and developed countries in the areas of development level and the technical uh, uh, levels and provide the developing countries uh, with uh, the uh, appropriate finance, technical and capacity building uh, support so as to improve the capacities of the developing countries to mitigate and adapt uh, adapted to the climate uh, change. Chair, during the COP27, China has uh, submitted formally to the Secretary of UNFCCC the report on the progress on the implementation of China's national, nationally determined contribution 2022, the latest version. And this report heavily fully reflect the progress and outcome of China to implement our nationally determined contribution. It also at the same time reflect the determination and the efforts of China to further promote no carbon uh, development and to address climate change uh, uh, challenges. Chair, within our capacity, China has also forged a partnership with other countries 
uh, uh, to address the climate change. Uh, until the July of 2022, China has totally arranged 1.2 billion Chinese yuan to carry out South-South cooperation on climate change. China has uh, signed 43 cooperation documents on climate change with 38 developing countries, and we have carried out more than 40 projects on climate change adaptation with 30, more than 30 developing countries. At the same time, China has uh, actively carried out capacity building trainings, and we have uh, uh, in total arranged in China uh, more than 40 uh, training cl class classes uh, on climate change, South-South cooperation, and have provided training for more than 2,000 uh, officials and uh, technical uh, officials in the area of climate change for 120 developing countries. We have established a three-year action plan on climate change between China and Africa, and also have established China-Pacific Islands Countries Climate Action Cooperation Center. So, Chair, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, China will continue to participate in the global actions to address climate change and put forward a uh, promote further the environmental preservation and the determination and to uh, foster a strong partnership uh, for a community of life for man and nature altogether. Thank you, Chair. That's my uh, comment on this item. Uh, I have a few comments on the uh, term of ref draft term of reference of technical uh, expert group on environment and the development. I appreciate the briefing by the chair uh, of this uh, group, and appreciate the efforts in drafting the term draft the term uh, terms of reference. China support the establishment of this uh, technical uh, expert group, and we hope that. Uh, as an intergovernmental uh, tech ex group, it can provide strong technical support to the division on the environment uh, and a group for further uh, accelerate the actions on the uh, efforts of the environment and the development. Uh, Chair, on, I have a few uh, proposals. Uh, on the terms of reference, overall functions, uh, para B, It said providing technical feedback and advice as appropriate to the Environment and Development Division on opportunities to accelerate actions and monetary progress across Asia Pacific region in key environmental areas. We propose to delete the moni to monitor progress. I think this is within the capacity of the committee, what we are doing today now, and uh, propose to change in key environmental areas into environment and sustainable areas to, comp uh, to keep synergy uh, with the whole uh, uh, text. Second, for the composition, paragraph uh, three, we, uh, we propose also a small amendment at the middle. It shall, open, shall be open to the involvement of major groups and other stakeholders as appropriate. Uh, we propose to uh, amend it as it may be open to the involvement of uh, major groups and other stakeholders appropriate. Each member and associate members may nominate a maximum of two experts. experts. Uh, so at the end, I just hope that uh, this technical group uh, will soon uh, be established and provide uh, valuable uh, support, technical support to the division and the committee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from China. Uh, now, um, uh, the secretariat would like to uh, receive the comments from the distinguished delegate from China for the terms of reference uh, in writing. Uh, Uh, 
I would now like to invite the distinguished delegate from S Sri Lanka to take the floor. Distinguished delegate from India, you may take the floor now. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, just uh, I have a very brief comment uh, pertaining to the uh, comment made by the distinguished delegate of China. Uh, regarding the terms of reference, just uh, I wish the Secretariat could just clarify that this document was finalized a few months ago and when the working group met and it was circulated to all the member states. That is my understanding. So, uh, of course, we don't have any uh, particular objection to entertaining minor uh, amendment, but just that is the clarification I just wanted the Secretariat to uh, address. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from India. Uh, I give the floor to the Secretariat to respond. Thank you for the, the proposal. Uh, <coughs> uh, your serious consideration of uh, this terms of reference and then also the overall support of uh, establishing uh, this uh, technical group. And then regarding this amendment, uh, certainly it has been uh, cleared by working group, but the adoption is uh, subject to the decision of uh, this uh, committee. So uh, perhaps the modification I mean, should be at the discretion my decision about this committee. So if there is a, I mean, from secretary side, the proposed modification, I note that uh, first point is uh, this paragraph 1B uh, regarding uh, suggesting to delete the monitor uh, and then there is also small changes, but sorry, I was not able to capture it. And then the second one, so it's a paragraph three. Uh, instead of a, it shall be open, uh, uh, suggesting to replace shall by may. So is my understanding correct? Uh, we would be grateful if you could uh, share with us uh, in writing so that we can properly reflect that and then circulate the revised version to our member state and associated members. Thank you. I recognize the request for the floor from the distinguished delegate from Iran. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my delegation would like to uh, draw the attention to the adverse impacts of land degradation and desertification on climate change and the need for the national plans and actions, as well as international cooperation to assist countries in their efforts to combat desertification. Disaster risk reduction by building the resilience of uh, communities to climate change related disasters is another measure which should be in the agenda of the governments, as well as the international community. Islamic Republic of Iran closely cooperated with the UNESCAP to address and overcome some of these environmental challenges, including the crisis of increasing dust storms, which is a cross-border issue and requires international and regional determination. While we attach great importance to follow up both mitigation and adaptation policies unjustifiable and unfair sanctions had limited our access to, final, to financial resources, new technologies, and tools uh, necessary for taking effect, effective steps to reduce emissions, uh, boost adaptation, and improve air quality. While emphasizing the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, my delegation is of the view that providing the developing countries 
with means of implementations by the international community will help them build their capacities and overcome the constraints and the climate change related problems. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Iran. I would now like to invite the distinguished delegate from the Convention on Biological Diversities to take the floor. Good afternoon. My name is Basil Van Aff, and together with Francis Ogwal, we're leading the negotiation of a global biodiversity framework. That is an agreement under the CBD that provides goals and targets to address the loss of biodiversity. We've prepared some slides and I will now share my screen so you get to see the slides. So this process of negotiation has been ongoing for three or four years uh, due to COVID, but let's focus on the current steps and what is coming up in the next few days and weeks. In June, we had the fourth meeting of negotiation that led us with a text that was uh, very complex and very difficult. In September, a technical group simplified that text, removing brackets, duplication, making it clear. This text will be negotiated by a fifth meeting of the negotiation group that will further reduce the number of brackets and deliver a better text to the COP. In the first week of the COP, the negotiation will continue and will deliver in the second week, a text to ministers where you ministers will be able to exercise your diligence in resolving the last issue. There is actually a group of three concurrent issues that you will need to address. Obviously, at the bottom in red is the agenda item. What are the action? What is the ambition you want to see uh, beyond just this the famous 30 by 30 addressing all the other drivers of biodiversity law? This will need to be together and in tandem with both the system for transparency and responsibility, but also resource mobilization, including capacity building. So the tree has to be negotiated together. We understand you have a particular interest in mainstreaming of biodiversity, which is how we're gonna be factoring biodiversity in all the decision. One of the key feature of this new framework is its capacity to address and engage all part of society, well beyond the environment sector to the whole of government and to the whole of society. Look at target 14, 15, and 16, and see how you can see the whole of your cabinet engage into this. Your role is important. You will need political support and high level engagement to secure the adoption of a robust GBF. We urge you to give your negotiator a strong yet flexible mandate, a mandate that enable them to design innovative solution and to reach consensus. As part of these mandates, you will define what will be success, but also uh, you will direct them to focus on the high level ele elements and remain flexible on the detail, the wording. Then in the second week, you will be engaging directly with your counterpart and negotiate the last element. We're looking forward to your engagement and we're looking forward to hear how your deliberation will go ahead today. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, distinguished delegate from the Convention on Biological Diversity. I would now like to invite the distinguished delegate from India Water Foundation. You have the floor, Dr. Arvind Kumar.
Yes. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleague. This is Dr. Arvind Kumar, President India Water Foundation. Uh, the majority of the population in Asia Pacific region uh, relies on the agriculture for their livelihood without uh, with about 60% of them residing in rural areas. Due to its uh, reliance on climate and weather, agriculture is probably the sector that is most vulnerable the area is predicted to be get uh, warmer overall. Rising temperature alter the way rain fall, which can lead to se uh, severe water shortage or, or floods, alter crop growing seasons or ever lower crop yields. Additionally, there will be additional environmental side effect that will harm agriculture pop population as a whole. Climate smart agriculture risk that are already uh, happening with much more intensity, CSA relate to the actions both on farm and beyond and include technologies, policies and institutions and investments. I would mention the example of uh, Meghalaya state in India in Northeast uh, located in fragile geo-environmental zone. It is subject to hydrological risks such as flood, drought, uh, flood syndrome and runoff of the rainwater from slopes of the Himalayas surrounding the state due to absence of water catchment and resulting in soil erosion. In the backdrop, India Water Foundation as a knowledge partner since 10 years, Meghalaya Basin Development Authority developed the integrated basin development and promoting livelihood program and introducing agroforestry as alternative livelihood opportunity. It is aimed to enhance community-led resource management across a range of diverse topographies in the state with a focus on uh, degraded forest restoration, agroforestry and homestead forestry to increase and expand tree plantation in a complementary uh, and integrated matter manner with the crops and the live livestock to improve productivity, uh, employment, income, and the livelihoods of the rural household. As a result of increasing temperature uh, uh, because of climate change, uh, tea started growing in Meghalaya. This is positive integration. And now and Meghalaya is one of the leading tea producers in India. The Integrated Basin Development Library Program had witnessed a large scale improvement in the economic benefits of the agroforestry. The objective is to share knowledge and experience uh, on the implementing climate smart agriculture and harness regional level collaboration to implement priority action link, uh, linking the CSA approach with agriculture related investments, policies and measures in their transition to CSA sharing and discussing mainstreaming and upscaling of CSA good practices and case studies. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from India Water Foundation. I would now like to invite the distinguished delegate from Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, and ladies and gentlemen, I am Prem Singh Tharu from Tharu Indigenous Community of Nepal representing Asia Indian People Pact, EIPP, and Indigenous Peoples Major Group. We Indigenous Peoples would like to thank to the UNDSCAP for organizing the 7th Asia Pacific Ministerial Session on the Environment and Development on the theme of protecting our planet through regional cooperation and, so and solidarity in Asia and Pacific. Indigenous Peoples have playing instrumental roles and significantly contributing to protect our planet and Mother Earth since time immemorial. As evidence, 80% of the biodiversity are conserved in the indigenous land and territories. Hence, meaningful participation and representation of indigenous peoples and their communities are vital in the regional cooperation and solidarity for achieving the ambitious goals relating to environment and development. We also highly appreciate the progress made by the Committee on Environment and Development said we 
we found the document of the agenda item 3 is very comprehensive. However, it has excluded the Indian peoples and their environment-friendly knowledge and sustainable practices, including knowledge and practices of women, youth, and their communities, which are crucial to be integrated in protection and conservation of the planet. Based on our historical contributions, but often marginalization and exclusion, we put forward the following key messages and collective recommendations. One, we urge to adopt and apply free, prior, and informed consent as the core conditional value for protection of the natural resources, biodiversity, ecosystem, and our planet in indigenous land and territories because it is one of the fundamental human rights which promotes to nature-based solutions and environment-based approach rooted in the rights, practices, and concerns of the indigenous people. We demand to acknowledge, recognize, and include unique indigenous knowledge and practices relating to the environmental protection and conservation in the regional cooperation and solidarity documents, along with scientific knowledge and technologies. Asia Pacific is the home of the 70% world's indigenous population who are the real environmental defenders in the region. Hence, we must be part of any regional cooperation and solidarity, and solidarity in all phases, process, and mechanisms. Excessive extraction and exploitation of natural resources in the name of development must be stopped because it has fueling to environmental crisis like loss of biodiversity, climate crisis impacting to the ecosystem, and violating environmental human rights of the indigenous peoples, women, youth, and their communities, and ultimately indigenous peoples' lives and cultures. Many indigenous peoples and their communities are displaced and evicted from their ancestral lands and territories in the name of conservation and national parks. We strongly urge the governments and even agencies to stop evictions of indigenous peoples and respect human rights-based conservation approach. Without proper APIC, any development and conservation programs or projects in indigenous land and territories are not accepted and allowed as per the international human rights instruments. The use of hazardous toxic chemicals and pesticides in the name of smart agriculture are contaminating the soil and polluting the water and air and also affecting to the birds and other species, including to the human health and well-being. We urge to promote the use of biofertilizers, indigenous seeds, and indigenous way of agriculture for, for, for food security and protecting the human being, species, ecosystem, and planet. Last but not the least, we look forward to a meaningful and genuine partnership with all. Our planet is our accountability and responsibility, so let's collectively act to respect the planet, to protect the planet together. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Asia Indigenous People, the Distinguished Delegate from the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. Are there any other representatives uh, who wishes to speak? I see no requests for the floor. Uh, so thank you all for those insightful and interesting remarks and for an excellent session. Um, with regards to the terms of reference of the technical ex expert group on environment and development, may I take that the committee decides to adopt these as contained in document SCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash 3 with proposed amendments from China. The Secretariat will present the amendments. Sorry, <laughs> the, it's not available on, on the screen. But the amendment will propose the amendment from China is as follows. Uh, I, I am hoping that our distinguished delegation have uh, the document uh, before you. So f first the amendment is uh, paragraph 1B. There is a sentence to accelerate action and monitor progress. So this uh, monitor progress uh, will be deleted. So, so the revised uh, amended uh, language will be to accelerate action across the Asia Pacific region. And then uh, in key environmental areas, so in these key environmental areas uh, would be 
amendita, as a embalmed and sustainable development areas. And then third proposed amendment uh, is paragraph three. The current language is, it shall be open to the involvement of major groups and other stakeholders. The shell will be replaced by may. So it will, the amendment, amended language will be, uh, it may be open to the involvement of major groups and other stakeholders. Uh, Secretariat has also checked with a chair of a working group, uh, which is fine with uh, this amendment. So if uh, there is uh, no other views on this. Uh, I'd like to invite the, the distinguished delegate from Fiji. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Secretary. I'm just perusing through the Chinese proposals for the amendment to the terms of reference. And uh, two, two comments from here. I take it, my delegation take it that this has been agreed to by the, the meeting last year. I, I may be wrong, uh, Madam Chair. And the second is the, to delete the word monitor. What would be the role of this committee? Uh, to me, it's meaningless given the mandate of this committee. So I, I just ask my distinguished colleagues from China, you know, if uh, they can clarify their position because f uh, from our perspective, from the Fijian delegation perspective, uh, to make monitor redundant, it defeats the whole purpose of this committee. As, 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 our, as we've already stated, the small island developing states are facing the wrath of climate change. And if we're not going to monitor this in this committee, then the whole uh, iron works here does not serve any purpose. I would just like to make that and ask our distinguished colleague from China to just provide me um, a response so that I can be satisfied with it. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Fiji. Are there any other requests for the floor? I would now like to give the floor to the Secretariat to make some clarifications. Sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. So there are two comments from distinguished delegation from Fiji. The first uh, 
uh, point is regarding whether it, this document, the terms of reference, was already agreed by last committee. That's the first question. And then second one is regarding uh, question on the, the word uh, monitor. But uh, regarding first question, let me ask my colleague who steered the process from last uh, committee session and then also uh, and then towards uh, this committee. Kurt. Thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you for the, the questions. Um, at the last committee meeting, at the sixth committee, the committee decided um, to establish the technical expert group and ask the secretariat to work um, with member states on the terms of reference, which would then come back to the, uh, to the member states here at this committee uh, for endorsement. And so the working group was established under the Bureau, and these terms of reference are presented in this background document uh, for your endorsement. So again, the, the, the last committee um, decided to establish the technical expert group, and what you have before you are the terms of reference for that group. Uh, I think as, as it was pointed out, it is the committee that would be monitoring progress, and this technical expert group is uh, providing support to the sub-program and to member states in, in providing expertise from their various ministries uh, in support of the program. I recognize the request to the floor from the distinguished delegate from China. Thank you, uh, Chair. I would like to uh, uh, answer the questions uh, proposed by the distinguished delegate from Fiji. Indeed, the first question has been uh, already answered by the Secretary. Uh, last committee meeting in 2020, the committee decided to establish this technical expert group and ask the Secretary to prepare this ter draft terms of reference. So it's time for the committee today to endorse this draft term of reference. As I said, I appreciate the efforts uh, of the uh, Bureau group uh, who are uh, drafting uh, this draft terms of reference, uh, India, Russia, uh, and our one more uh, members for their efforts in drafting it. Second question about the monitor process. I want to remind, bring to the attention of our Fiji colleague, the monitor process is there, but it's not within the technical expert group. In our understanding, the technical expert group, if we look at the overall functions, the main focus, it will be provide technical support to the committee, especially to the division uh, of uh, environment and the div uh, development of SCAL. Uh, we think this technical expert group can play an important role to provide technical uh, advice for the uh, division to promote actions in the areas of environment and sustainable areas, but it's for the is for the committee what we are sitting here to monitor the process uh, to, uh, of the whole picture of the division of the environment and uh, sustainable uh, and development and also for the committee we are here to monitor the uh, implementation of the uh, of the 2030 sustainable development all these areas uh, in asia and the pacific i hope i answer your question thank you Thank you, distinguished delegate from China. Are there any other requests for the floor? On this? Uh, distinguished delegate from Japan, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a technical um, question and correction. Uh, we believe that the request was to change the word shall in both instances instead of just one. I think there are two shalls in paragraph three. Uh, we prefer that to be replaced by will. The technical ex expert group will comprise. 
shall is treaty language, so we prefer not to use it in this context. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Japan. Distinguished, I recognize the distinguished delegate from China. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair. First of all, let me say we uh, welcome the participation and the contribution from the uh, major groups and other stakeholders uh, in the work uh, of the ESCAP uh, in accordance with the rules, procedures, and the mandate uh, of ESCAP. Uh, however, as we see, this technical expert group on the, the committee is an intergovernmental process. So it's, a, it's as it's written in three, four, five, six members and, and associate members may appoint expert. Members and expert members may delegate. So in this total understanding, uh, as we say, we keep the opportunities for the participation of the major groups and other stakeholders, but it should be, may be opened to them as appropriate. I thank you, I will insist on that. Thank you, distinguished delegate from China. Are there any other member states wishing to take the floor? Um, I would like to invite the distinguished delegate from the United States to take the floor. Yep. Thank you. Um, it was just a question of the Bureau. Was it the Bureau's intention um, in um, providing this language that this technical expert group not move forward without broader non-governmental um, participants? Uh, is that the reason for the phrasing of shall? Um, if so, perhaps the, the word will does um, ensure the intention that this technical expert group be broader than government, that it be a more whole of society um, than uh, if that is the intention. If that was not the intention, then of course may is also appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, distinguished delegate from the United States. Um, distinguished delegate from Australia, you have the floor. 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, we just support Japan also in the United States in that we our strong preference would be not to use shall because it is indeed treaty language. Um, I think we, depending on the intention of the Bureau, we could go with either may or will. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Australia. Um, may I ask uh, the distinguished delegate from Fiji, do you have any more comments for, on, on this, on the clarifications? Thing? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I, I, I sort of reopened these discussions because uh, for, I thank the distinguished delegate of China for the clarifications. I too would like to see that the treaty language is not used, shall, and we use will or may, as being mentioned, because I would like to have my major groups also participate in this discussion, not being prescri prescribed as to what they can or cannot do. For me, that's, the, that's critical in this, uh, this process. Sustainable development is for everyone. It cannot be just confined to government. That's the point that I was trying to raise here. Thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Fiji. Distinguished delegate from China, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, listening to the comments of uh, colleagues, I just, uh, I think we have uh, uh, already got some common uh, agreement. As we said, this para, uh, the technical expert group is an intergovernmental one uh, to provide technical advice, support, and assistance to the work of ESCAP and also the Division on Environment uh, and Development. However, as we said, we welcome the participation as appropriate, the major groups and other stakeholders, which is also an important part, an uh, important part of our work to address the actions of the environment and the development. So to say that, uh, we propose to uh, to uh, make it it may be open. So we keep these opportunities of cooperation with the major groups and other stakeholders. At, at the same time, taking into consideration the nature of this technical expert group. I uh, thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from China. So with regards to the terms of reference of the technical expert group on environment and development, uh, may I take it that the committee decides to adopt these as contained in document ESCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash 3 with proposed amendments from China supplemented by other member states? Uh, I request the Secretariat to read out the revised uh, terms of reference. Uh, 
So section one, para B, would now read providing technical feedback and advice as appropriate to the Environment and Development Division on opportunities to accelerate action across the Asia Pacific region in environment and sustainable development. In section two, para three, it would read, the technical expert group will comprise technical experts nominated by SCAP members and associate members who have recognized competence in matters related to the environment and sustainable development. It may be open to the involvement of major groups and other stakeholders as appropriate. Each member and associate member may nominate a maximum of two experts. Thank you, Secretary. Are there any comments from member states? Uh, I see no request for the floor, so may I take it that the committee decides to adopt the terms of reference of the technical expert group on environment and development uh, as contained in document SCAP slash CED slash 2022 slash 3 uh, with the amendments. Uh, it is so... Thank you to all distinguished delegates. We will move to agenda item four, other matters, without a break. We kindly ask you to stay in the room. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, we will now move on to agenda item four, other matters. Under this agenda item, the committee is invited to take note of the following. The chair and the vice chairs of the senior official segment of the seventh session of the Committee on Environment and Development examined the credentials of repre representatives received by the member states in accordance with Rule 12 of the SCAP Rules of Procedure. The Bureau noted that credentials had been received by a total 29 member states and found them to be in order. May I take it that it is the wish of the committee to take note of the report of the chair and vice chairs? I see no objections. It is so desi decided. Would any delegation like to raise any other matter? I see none. I will close the session and our discussion for today. Thank you all for those insightful and interesting remarks and, a, and for a fruitful and productive accomplishment of the senior officials segment. I'm pleased to inform you that the outcome of the senior officials segment will be considered at the ministerial segment when it convenes on Thursday, 1st December, 2022. And now before we leave, I would like to invite the secretariat to make some announcements. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, thank you very much for your participation throughout this busy and productive day. Tomorrow, starting from 9 a.m., in this conference room, we invite you to join us for the following partnership events. At 9 a.m., in this conference room, one, co-hosted by Government of Mongolia, 
and Maldives partnership event on lessons for building an air quality management framework for Asia Pacific region will be held here. At 10 o'clock, conference room three, co-hosted by SCAP Regional Office for the Pacific, IOM, IRO, OHCHR, uh, Pacific Islands Forum, PDD, so partnership event on promoting a regional approach to respond to climate related mobility in the Pacific. And at 11 a.m., uh, back to this room, hosted by SCAP and GIZ, UCLG, and so partnership event on Urban Act, integrated climate action for low carbon and resilient cities will be held. We will also have a side events during lunch hour from 12.30 to 13.50. In the meeting room, uh, A, uh, Acid Deposition Monitoring Network in East Asia, ENET, organized by uh, Ministry of Environment of Japan, where light refreshment will be also served. Meeting room H, strengthening the Environment Health Nexus and One Health in Asia Pacific, organized by ESCA, FAO, UNEP, and WHO. Also, if you have not yet visited the exhibition booths, we welcome you for tour this week. Also, all the information is available on CD website. Uh, this is also a reminder that the previous Asia Pacific Ocean Day will be held tomorrow afternoon from 2 to 4.30 in conference room 3. Uh, finally, the Secretariat would like to request all delegates and participants to please fill in an evaluation questionnaire for the committee session before session ends. You may use the QR code as shown on screen. It's not okay. Thank you. Thank you, Secretariat. The meeting is adjourned. We need some excitement. Uh, uh. No, well, problem is, uh, I mean, of course, I have a, you know, we, I have a.